won the election. Elections have consequences. 40,000 people a day are contracting COVID. 200,000 dead. The president has no plan. This guy will close down the whole country and destroy our country. Joe, you could never have done the job that we did. You don't have it in your blood. Fund what needs to be done now to save lives. We're doing therapeutics already. Fewer people are dying when they get sick. We've done a great job. I don't wear masks like him. Every time you see him, he's got a mask. He could be speaking 200 feet away from it. He shows up with the biggest mask I've ever seen. Question Why because, would you answer that because question? the question you is, the question Supreme is, justice, the radical question is, left. Would you shut up, your, man? Listen, You're the, the worst way, president voice. America has <laughs> ever had. It's the final sprint to the presidential election, and tonight is the last chance for the candidates to make their pitch before a national audience. It's debate night in America, and President Donald Trump and challenger Joe Biden will take the stage in Nashville, Tennessee, in an hour. Welcome to this Washington Post special report. I'm Libby Casey. Well, millions of Americans are already voting, and there are just 12 days till Election Day. It's time for a closing argument from the candidates. Let's start by going live to Nashville and Belmont University, the site of tonight's final debate. Political reporter Joyce Coe is covering it live and joins us now. Good evening, Joyce. Good evening, Libby. We are live outside of the debate hall here in Nashville, Tennessee, where for the final time, President Donald Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden will face off and make their case to voters. Now, the second presidential debate that was supposed to be last week was canceled uh, following President Trump's coronavirus diagnosis uh, and subsequently his dropping out of that virtual debate. So tonight will be the final time that the two candidates are on the same stage giving their closing arguments. From President Trump, we'll be looking to see whether or not he changes his strategy at all tonight, whether or not he changes the course of the race, because in polling we have seen he has a lot of ground to make up. Uh, as far as Joe Biden is concerned, tonight will be a chance for him to go after President Trump uh, on his response to the coronavirus and perhaps continue his appeal for national unity. Uh, one thing is for certain is that both candidates will be making their appeal to undecided voters. But just today, uh, we've seen 47.1 million voters across the country casting their votes in uh, an early election, so early uh, Vote voting and as well as mail-in voting. And that number has already surpassed 2016's total number of early voting. So certainly uh, a lot is at stake tonight, but much of America has already signaled that they've made up their minds. Libby? Mm. Well, Joyce, the first and only other presidential debate was a few weeks ago now, but we all remember how chaotic and unfocused it was because of President Trump's constant interrupting. And the debate commission pledged to try to make some changes after that. So let's talk about what's different tonight. So one thing that will uh, be different tonight is the addition of the mute button is what they're calling it. Uh, the debate rules have always been to give each candidate two minutes of uninterrupted time at the top of the question, and then the debate uh, can include discussions back and forth between the candidates. However, despite both candidates agreeing to those rules the first time around, we of course saw what happened with all of the interruptions uh, and name calling and back and forth, uh, which led to very little substance uh, for the viewers. So tonight we will see the use of the mute button uh, where the audio will be cut from the speaker from the candidate who is not supposed to be speaking at the time and then that the audio will be lifted so we can hear both candidates when they are in the discussion portion of the questions. President Trump's response to the news this week that there would be a mute button was uh, not one that was pleased. He said uh, he went after the commission attacking them and really complaining that they could cut him off at any time. Uh, Biden supporters, on the other hand, sort of saw this as a, a positive thing for him not to be interrupted. But one thing to keep in mind is that the mute button is really only in effect for the television viewer because on stage in person, of course, President Trump could uh, choose to continue his campaign strategy and attack Joe Biden on stage. Uh, and, you know, that leading to Joe Biden having to deflect on stage or potentially getting flustered where the pre the television audience really has no idea what's going on. So tonight we'll be looking to see if we can actually hear uh, any interruptions despite those muted mics uh, and despite, you know, this potentially leading to a more subdued conversation between the two candidates. It could also lead to some awkward moments uh, where the viewer is sort of trying to figure out what's going on. 
Libby. Great point. Joyce Coe, thank you so much. We'll check back in with you in just a little while. Well, with me now to set the stage for tonight's debate, Rhonda Colvin, Capitol Hill reporter, and James Homan, national political reporter. So good to see you all. So, Rhonda, we got a preview from Joyce. What do these candidates have to do tonight? Let's start with Joe Biden. Well, with Joe Biden looking at the polling and seeing that there's a lot of energy out there for him, I think he needs to make sure that he keeps that energy up among his supporters and those who have not yet voted. Yesterday, President, uh, former President Obama was on the campaign trail for Biden, and he said, he told the supporters, do not rely on the polling, even though it looks favorable for Joe Biden right now. Get out there and vote and don't be lazy. That's what he said. And that suggests that Democrats know that they want this to be a landslide. They don't want people to stay at home look at the polling, feel that it is uh, good for Joe Biden right now and not remain engaged. So Joe Biden has to keep up enthusiasm. And that's really no small task when you, your opponent is President Trump, who is, of course, very charismatic. His base has done boat parades and car parades and have, you know, large flags that they drive through uh, different small towns throughout the country out there for him at rallies during a pandemic. So Joe Biden has to bring enthusiasm tonight and, and needs to do that in order to get anybody who is going to vote for him ready to go to the polls. All right, Rhonda, what do you see as Donald Trump's job tonight? Donald Trump's job is really utilizing this moment because he's cut ads in a lot of key battleground states and this moment tonight, his camp knows that everyone's watching. They may have made up their minds in terms of who they're going to vote for, but they may be curious as to how he uh, comes out tonight and how this plays. So his team knows that. They want him to be a little bit more measured than he was uh, in the last debate in Cleveland. They uh, certainly don't want as many interruptions or uh, anything that might portray them um, in that combative way that many people felt he was in that first debate. So he, we're hearing that his tone may be a little different. Uh, his camp says he may inject a little humor tonight, uh, but for right now he's going to have to use this 90 minutes uh, very well in order to, if he wants to gain any votes. Let's go to James Homan. James, President Trump is the incumbent, and yet we're all talking about it as though he's the challenger, right, because he's down in the polls. Um, so. Does he take the advice of his advisors and change his attitude, change his tone, or do we see Donald Trump being Donald Trump? We're going to see Donald Trump be Donald Trump, but that could be a little bit different. It's amazing watching those video clips from that first debate, which feels like forever ago. The president very probably had the coronavirus as he was there, kind of being so belligerent. Our reporting tells us that while the campaign publicly complained about the mute button for the first two minutes, privately, uh, a lot of Trump advisors were quite pleased with it because they want the president to interrupt less. They want Biden to talk more. Uh, so I, I think it's certainly the president is going to be more subdued than he was the first time. Uh, but the, his response to his three day hospitalization at Walter Reed shows that he has not really been chastened. He hasn't changed his tone. Uh, initially, when he was in the hospital, there was this feeling among his campaign team that it was a chance for a reset and a pivot to kind of talk about how he had faced down the virus and had learned from it. Uh, but we've seen none of that in his nightly rallies. And uh, and, and so I think, you know, he, there will be some attempt to modulate. But the main dynamic here is that he has to turn the tide of the race. And you don't turn the tide of a race that you're losing uh, by double digits in national polls unless you kind of throw some hard punches and try to get your opponent off guard. So those are the, the tensions that Trump has to weigh between. The third dynamic is that he is not prepared in any kind of traditional way. Because this is the last real opportunity that Trump has to change the trajectory of the race, Biden has been hunkered down. Uh, you know, when Barack Obama had his big drive-in rally in Philadelphia last night, Biden was half an hour away at his house in Wilmington going through, uh, practicing, rehearsing uh, for each of the six topic areas that are going to come up tonight. And he has had a very, very quiet schedule this week. He hasn't left his house, frankly, since he went to North Carolina briefly on Sunday. And it's because Biden really wants to be crisp and smooth. Meanwhile, Trump's been flying around the country. He has not done the kind of traditional debate prep, which he did do before the first debate. Partly that's because a bunch of the advisors from that first debate prep, including Chris Christie and Kellyanne Conway, ended up getting the coronavirus. Partly it's because Trump doesn't like to sit and do debate prep, but he hasn't kind of done the traditional, here I'm gonna practice my two minute answer sort of preparation that you would historically expect from 
whether you're the incumbent or the challenger in a presidential debate like this where you know more than 60 million Americans are going to be watching. Uh, James, the president has also had to think about fundraising, though, you know, in, in this last push here because he is so far behind Biden in terms of cash on hand. And he had a fundraiser this afternoon in Nashville with his daughter Ivanka. Uh, they they are the the Biden campaign has about four times as much cash on hand, which is remarkable. A few months ago, Brad Parscale, who was then Trump's campaign manager, described their campaign as the Death Star, uh, which maybe was a, a more apt metaphor than than Parscale realized. And so he does need cash. Uh, one of the things that's amazing is, so the, the Trump campaign has to reimburse the government for using Air Force One for purely political trips. And Trump has opted to use a smaller Air Force One uh, so that they have to reimburse less money. That's how cash strapped they are right now. They've been canceling ad buys in several critical states. And so that is that has been an imperative. It's incredibly unusual at this stage of the race uh, to, to be doing high dollar fundraisers the way Trump is doing. But not only was he doing that in Nashville today, he spent uh, Monday in, in California, or I guess Sunday in California doing fundraisers. That's not a, a good use of the president's time two weeks out from an election. Yeah, instead of preparing for the debate, doing fundraisers right. in, in California, not, not, not a state that we're really focused on, <laughs> of course, as we look at those competitive states. Well, you know, tonight's debate comes as America registers its worst single day of new coronavirus cases in three months and the third highest count on record so far. Elections are referendums on the current president. So let's talk about what Donald Trump has to do tonight to convince voters who are worried about coronavirus that, that he has a good plan. Rhonda, let's start with you. Yeah, the coronavirus is issue one, two, and three probably for most voters and people watching tonight. And it's going to be certainly center stage here at the debate. There's going to be that plexiglass. There's going to be the people in the audience wearing masks. So this is going to be something that he won't be able to escape. And it certainly is a part of uh, the standard topics that are, are going to be asked today by Kristen Welker. So he's going to have to answer to some very tough questions. Today also, uh, Columbia University came out with this uh, study showing that had there been a better response by our government leaders, far fewer deaths would have happened. So this is all on people's mind. The evidence is out there, the data is out there, and he's going to have to, to say something uh, tonight about it. And James Homan, uh, President Trump not happy about uh, this as a topic, but it's unavoidable. Yeah, and the president is going to try to pivot to the economy. Uh, the economy continues, including in our polling nationally and in states, to be an advantage. People trust Trump to oversee the economic recovery more. Uh, and, and as the economy also loses momentum and slips in contrast to other countries that were able to get this under control, uh, people still think Trump is better slightly on the economy than Biden. So expect him to, uh, one, project that the virus is more under control than the statistics show, uh, which is, is a hard case to sell and will make him look in denial. But two, to try to change the conversation into something about reopening and you've got to get kids back to school and the cure can't be worse than the disease, as the president often says, because he knows that's ground where he actually has an advantage. And while the coronavirus is the number one issue, you know, we, we saw a, another bad unemployment rate today. You have 23 million people right now who are collecting unemployment, and, uh, and, and a lot of them want to get back to work. They obviously want to do it safely, but the, the president, I think, is going to make an effort to appeal to, to those folks. Well, for more about the coronavirus pandemic and the Trump administration's response to it, let's go to national video reporter Hannah Jewell, who is live in the newsroom. Hannah. Hi, Libby. I'm here with our colleague on the video team of The Washington Post, Whitney Shefty, who's just spent the last six months really making a documentary about the entire coronavirus pandemic and specifically what past presidents did to prepare for it and what the Trump administration did with that information and those warnings. So Whitney, what did the Trump administration do with the uh, warnings and the preparations of past presidencies? Yeah, so this really does start with the Clinton administration. They're kind of the first administration to take pandemic preparedness seriously and, and start to think about how, how to manage it. And then we saw the, uh, the Bush administration and the Obama administration also take this on in, in various ways. And some of the things that came out of these administrations were the creation of the, the national stockpile. Um, there was the creation of a National Security Council office on, on global health issues. And that was really significant because it was sort of a, a signifier that we saw health and security as very interconnected. 
Um, and then in the Bush administration, a pandemic playbook was created for the first time and handed to the Obama administration. And they had to deal with crises like H1N1 and Ebola and then handed that to the Trump administration. Um, what we know from, from the Trump era, from a, a former coronavirus task force member that we interviewed, is that they got the playbook and they referred to it pretty early on. But she says that ultimately it, it wasn't really followed very closely. So one of the many people you spoke to was Olivia Troy, who was a member of Trump administration's uh, coronavirus task force. Here's some of what she said. I think the frustrating part, and sometimes shocking, was the comments that the president would say. The comments about, you know, maybe COVID is a good thing. I don't have to shake hands with these disgusting people. Some people chuckled about it. I saw other people have a similar reaction to me, where either their eyes were a little bit wide, or they looked away, or they shifted their gaze to down at the table in front of them, or looked at the floor. I don't know how you say that out loud, knowing that people are hurting, and the hurt that is yet to come. So you can view that full length uh, documentary next week on our homepage. It's called America's Pandemic. It's really just a brilliant, comprehensive look at this whole thing. I haven't seen anything like it yet. So keep an eye out on uh, YouTube and on the Washington Post homepage. Libby? Great. Thank you so much, Hannah Jewell and Whitney Shefty. Well, coming up, we'll look at voter enthusiasm and get an update on early voting and absentee numbers. Stay with us. As business moves forward, we're changing the way things get done, like how we redefine collaboration and keep our customers happy. You can rely on AT&T to help keep your business connected. I'm Lillian Cunningham, the creator and host of the Presidential Podcast. When you look across the history of presidential debates, you notice something interesting about the first debate in the series. It's not always a great debate for incumbents. In 1984, Ronald Reagan was running for his second term. This was a Republican president with a high approval rating and a person who felt very comfortable in front of a television camera. Yet, by most accounts, he was judged to have had a poor, rambling performance against his challenger, Democrat Walter Mondale. We saw something similar again in 2012 with incumbent President Barack Obama. A seated president running for his second term, he was challenged by Republican Mitt Romney, and again, by almost all accounts, his debate performance was surprisingly poor. His campaign staff even publicly noted how disappointed they were in his performance. Now, in both of these cases, the two presidents did go on to perform much better in the subsequent debates, and they did win their elections. But it's worth paying attention to the fact that there just seems to be something tricky for incumbents about that first debate out of the gate. This is the big debate night, a final matchup between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Welcome to this special report from the newsroom of The Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey. With me tonight, Rhonda Colvin, Capitol Hill reporter, and James Homan, national political reporter. James, it seems like one big difference in those past performances by incumbents was the recognition that they needed to do better or needed to do something different. President Trump rated his performance in the first debate quite high. Uh, so, so are there lessons learned you know, by the campaign or from President Trump himself about how that first debate went. I think Trump feels like, let Trump be Trump. I think Trump's aides have told him, they've told us that they've told him, that he needs to interrupt less, that he needs to let Biden stumble, uh, that he needs to try to make this race more about a choice between him and Joe Biden than a referendum on Trump. And the more Trump kind of talks about himself uh, and counterpunches, the more it's a race about Trump. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right that uh, the president's, you know, o Obama, I covered the, the 2012 campaign full time. And I was at, I think I might have even been in that that picture that they uh, showed uh, from that Denver debate that was such a disaster. Uh, and Obama really did hunker down, prepare and come back strong, uh, had some great lines in that second debate. 
And it, and it's possible that the Trump campaign is trying to lower expectations tonight by kind of insisting that the president isn't preparing when in fact he kind of is talking through what he's going to say uh, and, and that maybe they hope that that somehow works to their advantage. But there's no evidence at this point after four years that Trump is, is meaningfully going to change. And if you need you know proof of that, you can look at his NBC town hall last Thursday night uh, where he in many ways was, was just like he was in the first debate. Uh, and, and you can also look at his attacks on Kristen Welker uh, the last couple days, the moderator tonight. Uh, none of that suggests that, that he's really going to kind of represent himself as anything different than the, the Trump we've come to know so well. Mm, Rhonda, James brings up an important point too. President Trump has been attacking journalists generally, but specifically going after women journalists, attacking Kristen Welker, despite you know past praise of her, uh, you know sort of generally um, attacking Leslie Stahl for the CBS interview. The president, though, has a real problem with women and poll numbers, and 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 women approving of his behavior and attitude, and how he acts. Right? Does he seem? presidential. So so how does that get factored in tonight? Right, and also I'd add Savannah Guthrie too yeah. in the town hall from last week. He also talked about her and made uh, disparaging comments about that situation as well. So this is a part of a trend. We even saw it in 2016 as well uh, that he appears not to uh, want hard hitting questions from female journalists or many journalists, even male journalists. So this is a part of an ongoing trend with him. And uh, he released the 60 Minutes clip earlier today, possibly um, an infringement on the production agreement that uh, he had with C CBS. So this, this is a part of Trump and this debate. And Trump in this campaign is going after journalists. And some of his base like that. They like that pushback against you know uh, news or so-called fake news. And this is a part of a long trend that he really seems to be revving up this weekend in particular. Uh, James, let's talk though about how the president's performing in, in this sort of the gender gap, right? How women see him versus how men see him. So the, the gender gap is historically large, partly because Trump's not doing as well with men as he did in 2016. But he, he's, you know, Joe Biden is actually doing about twice as well with women right now as Hillary Clinton was at this stage in the race. Uh, what what I've picked up on in interviews and reporting and talking to operatives in both parties, especially in in swing states like Ohio, was a lot of women uh, were rubbed the wrong way by the way that Trump attacked Biden for Hunter Biden's addiction in the first debate, uh, that it really upset a lot of people in focus groups uh, and that it's kind of come up uh, in both campaigns have noticed that. Uh, that, that the president kind of just seemed like a jerk uh, and, and as, as he was talking about his, his opponent's son and his struggles. And we know tonight uh, all indications are that Trump is planning to bring up Hunter Biden again. He wants to focus on Hunter Biden. Uh, we're a little unclear on how Biden himself is going to handle that. Uh, but the, the Trump campaign has said that aides have urged the president to kind of be a little bit more sensitive, especially when it comes to talking about addiction, because it's been overshadowed by the pandemic, but the opioid crisis actually continues to get worse. Uh, there were you know, a record number of opioid overdoses in the first half of this year in 46 of the 58 counties in Ohio, including a lot of Trump counties. And so that I, I think, you know, the kind of just seeming callous is, is part of what has fueled the gender gap to where it is, not to mention his attacks on female journalists, but also, you know, over the weekend, he was saying, lock up Gretchen Whitmer, the, the governor of Michigan. Uh, you know, the, the news comes so fast, it's easy to forget stuff like that. But I think that there is this cumulative sense among the electorate that, that Trump is just kind of a, a, a mean spirited guy. Well, joining us now, let's go to Washington Post senior data scientist Lenny Bronner. Lenny, welcome. Uh, so, Lenny, let's talk about what we know about how many people have already voted. What are the numbers? Hi, Libby. Thanks for having me. Um, using our best estimates from Secretary of State's offices and County Board of Elections, uh, we know that at least 47 million Americans have already cast their ballots. That's uh, as many people as voted early in 2016, and it's more than a third of the whole turnout in 2016. So, Rhonda, let's go to you on, on what that means for this debate. I mean, does that make this debate less consequential or less of a closing argument than a final debate has been in the past? 
It may make it less consequential when talking about wooing anybody who's undecided or who hasn't mailed back their ballot or voted in person in early voting. And this is something I spoke with with the uh, spoke about with the uh, House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer this week. I asked him if he was going to watch the debate, and he told me his thoughts. Take a listen. I'm going to watch the debate, uh, and and um, but I don't believe that. Very, very few minds uh, will be changed by this debate, no matter what happens. Uh, I think people are pretty well set and know what they want to do, which is why I see, I think you see this uh, overwhelming uh, early vote turnout. People, uh, people are very, very concerned, and, and they want their voice heard, and they've made up their mind. So anecdotally there, Hoyer is saying what Lenny is talking about and what the models are showing, that so many people have gone out uh, in comparison to past contests. So this really makes tonight's debate very unique because many people have already made up their mind or are planning to vote very soon. So James, what do you do with that as a candidate and a campaign? You know, who are you talking to? Is it undecided voters? Is it voters who are sort of sick of politics and just don't even know if they want to bother to vote? They're, they're seeing it all sort of muddied in the candidates. Are there really differences? Who are they reaching? It's really the latter. I mean, they're just, they're just, there are not that many people who are genuinely trying to decide between Biden and Trump. There are a lot of people who are trying to decide whether to vote at all. Uh, you know, the people who were voting earlier are, are partisans, they're passionate. Uh, the, the, there's a lot of people who just feel like politics is broken, uh, you know, and, and the Trump campaign is actively, you know, making efforts to try to dissuade African-American voters, for example, from supporting Biden by highlighting his work on the crime bill in the 1990s. Uh, you know, I think part of Trump's goal tonight is to, to kind of uh, highlight ways that Biden has frustrated the left to maybe convince some of the kind of the Bernie Sanders crowd uh, that that Biden isn't going to deliver for them. But that kind of contradicts Trump's other message, which is aimed at independence and people in the middle that Biden is is hijacked by the far left. Uh, but but I, I think, you know, obviously you want to persuade people to vote for you. Uh, ultimately, what every poll shows is that Trump's doing about what his approval rating is, because as I said a second ago, this election's really a referendum on Donald Trump more even than a usual presidential election is on an incumbent. And so Trump has struggled to kind of, in his vote share against Joe Biden, do better than his job approval rating. And so he has to kind of make people approve of him a couple points more. If his job approval rating continues to be 43% for the next two weeks, he will lose because there's not a, a strong third party uh, presence this year like last time. And so Trump has to, in some ways, make himself a little more palatable and acceptable. And that's where it's incumbent upon him to defend and even sell, tout his own record. Yeah. Uh, Lenny, let's go back to you. Can we learn anything about potential outcomes of this election from the absentee and early voting numbers or, or even looking at how many people have registered? So we can say that there's a lot of enthusiasm this year. Beyond that, I'd be very careful, and I'm a little bit weary about sort of drawing any stronger conclusions. Uh, so far, we know that more registered Democrats have returned their ballots than registered Republicans. Um, but that's, I would be careful about inferring too much. We, that All that tells us is that more Republicans are going to vote from now onwards in the next two weeks, and more Republicans are probably going to vote in person on Election Day. And the other thing to keep in mind is that voter registration is really not the same as presidential vote choice. Uh, nearly 10% of registered Democrats voted for Donald Trump in 2016. That's true all across the nation, but it's especially true in the South and in states like Oklahoma and Kentucky and West Virginia, where between 20 and 30 percent of registered Democrats voted for Donald Trump. Mm. Uh, James, this year, of course, has been a lot of incentive for people to become Democrats so they could be involved in the primary process, right? I mean, th there was an effort to sort of, you know, get voters motivated, involved, because there was this big primary contest that seems, of course, like it was, you know, years ago at this point. So, so how do you interpret these numbers and, and look at the data? Data. Yeah, and to your point's absolutely right, and that's in Iowa, Democrats have gained a registration advantage because so many of the candidates were trying to register people earlier this year, so Trump won that state by nine points. Now it's neck and neck in every poll. I think what is happening is the pandemic has sort of thrown everything off. Traditionally, for the last several elections, Democrats vote much more early than Republicans do, uh, and and that is significant because it always has meant that Republicans are dependent on election day turnout. But the last several presidential elections, uh, including ones that 
you know, both of the elections Barack Obama won, uh, Republicans actually got more votes on election day. And, uh, and so that it'll be interesting to see how that dynamic changes. One of the things to pay close attention to is seniors. Uh, the president carried seniors four years ago by like 10 points nationally. That was the, the difference in Florida. Uh, because seniors are more concerned about the coronavirus than the economy, uh, Trump is, is neck and neck with Biden right now among seniors, which is a huge problem, especially in a state like Florida, which is so pivotal to his chances. Seniors, typically, because they're creatures of habit, like all of us, they go and vote on election day. That's changing this year because of the coronavirus, because of health concerns. Uh, and so it, 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 it's hard to have the kind of the data breakdown on how old some of these people are that are voting early. Uh, but th that senior block is, is make or break for Trump. And these are people who traditionally vote on election day. Perhaps they're gonna vote earlier than usual this year. It's, it's something that we're keeping an eye on as we look at, at some of these early polling sites and, uh, and talk to voters in places like the villages in Florida. So, Lenny, what are you preparing for on election night? You know, James just talked through for us sort of the complexities of this process right now. What are you getting ready for? Yeah, primarily we're getting ready for a really long night and possibly even a really long couple days or even a really long couple weeks. Uh, we're expecting this to be a really slow process and, you know, it takes its time to count votes and we want to be prepared for that. Um, primarily myself, what I'm preparing for is I'll be comparing results that we get on election night and beyond to historical results, primarily 2016, but even going back to uh, 2012 and 2008, all the way back to 1992 actually is how far we go back when we compare historical results to and sort of using those results and those comparisons, we try to sort of see what we could expect with the results going forward. So Lenny, you made your election model public today. So, so what can we see as part of that process? Yes, we uh, put code online showing how our model works. We published a small paper, a write up, a blog post sort of explaining how our model works and how sort of what we expect from it and the data that it uses and the data that it expects on election night. Uh, this is really an effort in transparency for us, showing what we're going to be doing on election night, um, how we're preparing and sort of making it clear um, what viewers can expect. All right, Lenny Broder, Washington Post Senior Data Scientist. Thanks so much for joining us, Lenny. Uh, Rhonda, let's go back to you uh, to talk about some of the optics of tonight. You know, we just can't shake that image, at least I certainly can't, of seeing President Trump enter the debate hall at the last debate, the first debate, and his family coming in and the family walking through with masks on, but then choosing to take them off and his entourage choosing to take them off as they sat down, that in violation of the, the guidelines, the rules that had been set up ahead of time. What will you be watching tonight in, in terms of the, the optics and, and the signals and also frankly the safety of the situation? Right. Yes, the director of the uh, Presidential Debate Commission did say adamantly that everyone who is entering today will be wearing a mask. They don't want a repeat of that situation you described. And if we look at our screen, it does appear that everyone we're seeing so far is wearing a mask and hasn't taken them off. That's been a, a pretty big issue here. Uh, we've, I think the commission has been under a microscope, honestly, and the way they've been handling these debates, more so than in past elections. So how they're going to handle tonight and make sure everybody else is sticking with the rules, that's really important because many people have even been saying, should we continue to have debates? Are they worthwhile? Are they efficient? Um, and, and the debate commission really has to answer those questions too tonight and, and make sure that this goes smoothly on their end. Um, outside of coronavirus uh, optics, I'm also looking tonight uh, with the optics of um, Welker, the moderator, Kristen Welker from NBC. She's uh, only the second black woman to moderate a presidential debate uh, in the last 30 years. The first one was Carol Simpson back in 92. Uh, so there's been a large span uh, of time where we have not had a woman of color asking questions. And one of the topics today is going to be on race. So how does that you know, change the tone or dynamic there for both of these men to answer a woman of color who's going to be asking some hard questions about race in America. Mm. We'll certainly be watching how those interactions go and the questions from Kristen Welker. We'll talk a little more about all the topics that she's outlined. But first, let's go to you, James, uh, to talk about the debate commission. I mean, President Trump has been attacking the debate commission. He's been attacking Kristen Welker, who is a sort of notedly fair um, and an excellent journalist uh, with a, a very strong resume. That's why she was put in this position in the first place. Um, where does this situation leave the debate commission and the future of debates? It's interesting, you know, the debate commission is bipartisan, not nonpartisan. 
And there are, you know, it's half Republicans and half Democrats. It's former kind of White House press secretaries. And Frank Ferenkopf, who's the co-chair of the commission, was the, the chairman of the Republican National Committee. But there's not really any kind of Trumpers. Uh, they're not never Trumpers, but, uh, you know, they're kind of establishment old line Republicans uh, who probably are kind of uncomfortable with Trump. Uh, but they, they, in many ways, are doing the exact same format that they did last time and the time before. And um, they actually have made a, a good faith effort to negotiate with the candidates and the campaigns to make all the ground rules clear and do walkthroughs. You know, the, the woman who's the executive director who kind of runs the commission on a day-to-day -day basis has been doing this job for 25 years now. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, the, we're going to continue to have presidential debates. There's just, it, it, that is the new normal. It is interesting, though, because uh, obviously we didn't have one of the three this year. And before, you know, after the Nixon-Kennedy debacle in 1960, uh, you know, for Nixon, uh, <laughs> there was not another presidential debate again until 1976. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it was because the, the process was so poisoned by kind of the frustrations that Republicans, frankly, had with the 1960 debates. And the Commission on Presidential Debates was created to avoid some of that awkwardness, uh, just like the party committees that tried to take over the primary debates on both sides. So I think that there could be some changes and some reforms. Some of it, frankly, depends on whether Trump gets reelected. But whether he gets reelected or not, Trump will not be debating in four years. And so, you know, I think more traditional conventional Republicans aren't going to spend as much time making kind of politically unhelpful fights with, you know, a debate commission that no one's ever heard of. And, you know, and, and, and a, a moderator that, you know, who's well liked and co hosts the Today Show on weekends is not, you know, is not kind of thought of in any way as like a, a harsh partisan. Well, joining us now, national political reporter Michael Shearer. Welcome, Michael. Tell us, what are you watching for tonight? I'm watching for the president's mood. You know, one of the things his advisors have been talking about a lot today is that he's in a very buoyant, upbeat mood, uh, and they're trying to get him there. They don't want the scowling, angry, interrupting Trump to come out again in, in quite the same way. And, and, you know, anyone who's worked for Trump knows that the, the most important thing for any response you get in interaction is how he's feeling. If he's in a testy uh, uh, situation, he's going to respond very testily to you. Um, and so I think what they're hoping for is, is uh, you know, a more optimistic, more joyful, uh, happier Trump than we saw at the last debate. I think it's a by no means a certainty. I mean, it has been a happier Trump you've seen the last couple of weeks. Uh, on the campaign trail, making a point of dancing to YMCA at the end of all his rallies. Um, but you also saw the 60 Minutes interview uh, uh, that the president released today, which, which certainly wasn't that. Um, and I think how he presents himself, the sort of tone he approaches uh, Biden and the moderator with, um, could go a long way in basically opening the door for Republicans who have left him, suburban voters who have left him, who voted for him last time, who may be skeptical and nervous about uh, uh, Biden administration, the policies they'll bring, but, but have been so uh, repelled by Trump's uh, performance this year that they're leaning now towards voting for Biden. And we're seeing uh, President Trump arriving now at the debate site in Nashville. Let's go live to our colleague, political reporter Joyce Coe, who's outside the debate site. So Joyce, what do we know about the format of tonight's program? Well, Libby, with each of these debates, we've seen uh, what we will see tonight, a 90 minute long commercial free program. Uh, and there will be six 15 minute long segments. Each of those segments will be broken down by topic. And the topics tonight are as follows fighting COVID-19, American families, race in America, climate change, national security, and leadership. Tonight's moderator will be NBC's White House correspondent, Kristen Welker, and she is someone who has covered both Biden and Trump, uh, Biden during the Obama years and Trump uh, in his entire first term in office. So she's someone who is extremely familiar with both candidates that will be on stage tonight. And I think we can expect her 
to really bring a level of confidence to tonight's debate because of that familiarity, as well as a, a line of in-depth questioning that we've seen from her reporting style, uh, both outside the White House and as well as on the anchor desk. Libby? So, Joyce, going into tonight, Kristen Welker knows that President Trump has attacked and complained about the debate topics that she selected. Uh, could that affect what we see? Well, earlier this week, we saw Bill Steppe and President Trump's campaign manager writing a letter to the debate commission, uh, going after them, really attacking them for being biased, is what they said, going after the moderator and Joe Biden, and ultimately saying, uh, quote, that Joe Biden is desperate to avoid conversations on his foreign policy record. Now, Trump's campaign has said that they do not want to be talking about any of the topics tonight, that they already discussed those in the first debate, and that they want to talk about foreign policy. They assert that both campaigns agreed a while ago that the foreign policy would be the topic of conversation at this third debate. Now, that is something that Trump's campaign completely refutes. They said that the Trump's campaign uh, and President Trump were lying when they said that because they agreed months ago, they said, uh, both campaigns with the moderator and the commission that they would uh, allow the moderator to pick the topics tonight, which we've seen in all of the prior debates as well. Uh, so a lot of discrepancy there and President Trump's campaign uh, uh, press secretary saying that Trump is afraid to uh, face more questions about his disastrous COVID response. And that is a direct quote. Uh, we have seen President Trump's campaign struggle to define their response to the coronavirus. Uh, and, you know, this is something that millions of Americans, whether it is health wise or economically, are struggling with. Uh, so it's certainly an important topic going into the election. And I think despite the topics that are on the table tonight, we can expect to see President Trump really injecting some of his own agenda and his own desire to tout not only his uh, sort of record on foreign policy throughout the last four years, but also go after Joe Biden uh, and attack him on his foreign policy record during his years in office uh, and his support for the Iraq war. Libby. All right, thanks so much, Joyce Coe in Nashville at the debate site. Well, the final presidential debate of 2020 begins in just a few moments. Stay with us. As business moves forward, we're changing the way things get done like how we redefine collaboration and keep our customers happy. You can rely on AT&T to help keep your business connected. the final countdown here to this last presidential debate. Thank you for watching with the Washington Post. So both candidates want to use this national audience to make their closing pitch with more about what to expect tonight. Rhonda Colvin, Capitol Hill reporter and national political reporters James Homan and Michael Shearer. Um, uh, let's go to you, James, uh, for a moment here about this question of foreign policy, because, yes, President Trump says he wants to talk about it. But, you know, Joe Biden has some foreign policy experience. I mean, th this is not like he's, you know, his candidate, his opponent, rather, is like a first time member of Congress. Right. This is someone with a long track record of working on foreign policy issues in the Senate and in the vice presidency. Yeah, a former chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, someone who I, I think likes to talk about foreign policy, especially in the primaries, more than his staff wanted him to. Uh, I think when the Trump campaign says foreign policy, what they mean is talking about Hunter Biden's business dealings. That's where the president wants to go uh, in, and uh, wants to make Biden uncomfortable, wants to get under his skin, wants to kind of you know hope that he's not unflappable. Um, but you know, Trump also doesn't have a particularly great foreign policy record. Uh, you know, the negotiations with the Taliban uh, on Afghanistan have have frankly failed, uh, and the Taliban is attacking again uh, as Trump and has been emboldened by Trump saying we're going to pull out by the end of the year. Uh, there's been a whole host of things. You know, North Korea has more nuclear warheads uh, and missiles that can hit farther into the continental United States than four years ago, despite the summits with Kim Jong Un. Uh, so there's there's a host of, of foreign policy issues that, you know, I think Biden would be very, very happy to engage on. And generally, I think what it'll come down to, uh, you know, one of the sections tonight is leadership and another is national security is uh, Biden will make the point that uh, America's standing in the world has diminished under Trump, that we're uh, less feared by our enemies and less respected by our allies. Michael, let's go to you for how much these candidates plan to 
fact check each other tonight and how the Biden camp in particular wants to use or not use his time sort of counter punching and, and fact checking. What's the strategy? I think you'll probably see a repeat of what you saw at the first debate where uh, Biden will claim whatever falsehood Trump has just said, or in some cases, you know, just something he disagrees with to be not true, but he won't get into the weeds with it. I don't think Biden has any interest in spending his allotted time uh, going over and over and back and forth with, with President Trump about, you know, whether characterization is accurate or what the details are, of whatever agreement. But I do think you will see the vice president uh, call out the president at, at a number of points tonight. Um, and, and I think one of the things we don't know is what role Kristen Walker will play uh, in, in, in that. I, I think there is a tradition of moderators in these presidential debates having some fact-checking role. It's often, it's, it's a blizzard of information you get thrown at, so you can't do everything, but there's a long, long history of moderators speaking up to correct candidates when they say something uh, in the debates. Um, I, I think you'll see also a repeat of what uh, Biden did in the last debate, which is trying to address as much as possible what he's saying to the American people directly to the camera. I don't think he or his campaign have any interest right now in making this uh, uh, you know, a one-on-one -on -one debate. I, Biden wants to get his message out. He thinks he's winning. His campaign thinks they're winning. And, and they know that the Trump campaign wants to make this a two-person race. And right now it's really being run as a referendum on the president. It's sort of a one-person race and, and Biden is, is the beneficiary. Well, debates can lead to the spread of misinformation about the candidates themselves or the election. Let's go back to Hannah Jewell for more on that. Hannah, what are tech companies doing to try and prevent the spread of misinformation in this election? So Libby, after the last debate, misinformation spread like wildfire on the internet. We had conspiracies about Joe Biden's health, about uh, false conspiracies, I should stress, about Joe Biden wearing an earpiece. And while this is definitely not true, a video stating that it was reached over half a million people on TikTok in the days following the debate. So I spoke to our um, Silicon Valley reporter, Elizabeth Dwoskin, about what unprecedented steps tech companies are taking to try and halt the spread of misinformation before it spreads. And she told me about, um, I, know, I think James mentioned earlier, the alleged Hunter Biden emails leak, this unverified story from the New York Post, which we're sure to hear about tonight. And Elizabeth told me about what tech companies did in response to that story in particular. Here's what she said. The tech companies, what they did in the case of the Hunter Biden email story was they took this very swift and aggressive action to limit the spread of that story. In Facebook's case, they demoted it before fact checking. In Twitter's case, they blocked the link with limited explanation, just saying that it fell under a hacked materials policy without explaining were the materials hacked. And for the first time, what I saw is the tech companies say, OK, no, we're just going to take swift, swift action to limit the spread of this type of story even prior to us knowing um, the, validity, the, the validity and provenance of it. And they're still doing that. But what you see is that even those actions give rise to other narratives. And I think the real question to focus in on is whether the weight of their actions stopped so many eyeballs from seeing the, that story that um, overall um, they really lessened the impact of this potential misinformation or whether those the megaphones that really want to spread it and are hell bent on spreading it have found ways to get around those bans. So this is really uncharted territories for tech companies who have been hesitant in the past to take this kind of action, moving before something can be verified or indeed proven to be untrue or true. Um, and as Elizabeth mentioned, it's interesting to see does this kind of action actually stop a story in its tracks or does it actually add some fuel to the fire? So it's something to keep an eye out for tonight and in these last days of the election. If tech companies will continue to take these really controversial steps to limit misinformation spread. And it's a good reminder for us all to not believe everything that you see on the internet. Libby. Thanks so much. Hannah Jewell live for us here in our newsroom. And a reminder that the Washington Post fact checker team will be hard at work tonight. They'll be tracking what's going on throughout the debate. You can watch on our on our website. Just go to WashingtonPost.com uh, and you'll see our live log as well as all the fact checking that's going on. And we will be back here with you after the debate tonight. So stick around. Our reporter team will have a analysis. We'll go over some of the uh, highlights 
potentially low lights. We'll see what happens tonight and uh, and discuss what it all means for the campaign going forward. Rhonda Colvin, uh, let's talk about what we know so far about what's happening in the room tonight. You know, there, there are so few journalists who have access, of course, because of COVID restrictions, um, but we are getting a better sense of how tonight is shaping up there in Nashville. That's right. I, I've just been looking at some notes here from the pool crew that is inside, and they say about 200 people should be in the hall tonight. Uh, we can't really see that right now with that camera angle, but it does appear that there is going to be an audience of about 200 people, and that's according to the Commission on Presidential Debates. Uh, also, the plexiglass, we can confirm, has been brought down. It was up earlier today, uh, but both uh, camps, I guess, have decided to uh, bring that down because they have both been tested, Trump and Biden, and they have tested negative. So under uh, the guidance of medical professionals and work with the Commission, they decided to bring down that plexiglass this evening. And uh, they're also spaced apart. You can see the lecterns there are spaced apart. And they are also uh, a few feet away, 16 feet actually, away from Kristen Welker's desk. So those are some of the optics, if you can't see them on your screen, of what's actually happening inside that debate hall. And I think this also brings up a point that we've kind of touched on through the night, but uh, the commission and both campaigns do a lot of negotiation they ahead of time. Both camps have representatives that negotiate everything from if the candidates will sit or stand, if there's going to be a table, all these small things. And of course, who picks the, um, the topics and if the moderator is going to have that sole responsibility of picking the topics. So all of that is mapped out ahead of time. So when we hear uh, candidates say that the commission is uh, against their side, that uh, should be looked at with some skepticism because the commission and both representatives from both camps do uh, have a series of talks before these nights take place. Uh, let's go to Michael Shear to talk uh, about some of the numbers here. You know, of course, we're watching the poll numbers. Our viewers are watching the poll numbers. The campaigns themselves are watching the poll numbers. Michael, what are the messages that the, both camps are trying to send out about where they stand in, uh, in, in the Americans' choices right now. I mean, you know, we, we've been talking about how so many people have already voted, but, but these polls are still significant and important. How are the campaigns interpreting them and talking about them? Well, the polls have been remarkably consistent for months. Um, you know, there's an argument to be made that if you go back to the spring, they haven't really changed much in any of these states. Now, there have been, uh, you know, it goes up a little, down a little. Uh, the president obviously had a, a rough patch uh, after the first debate and when he tested positive for COVID that he seems to have recovered from. But that leaves the race very much in Biden's favor. He is winning now in enough states to give him 270 votes, according to the polls. Um, the, 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 so he, he wants a continuation of the status quo. The president needs to shake this up and he needs to shake it up in, in the way uh, the 2016 race was shaken up in the final three weeks. There was a, a remarkable closing of the polls uh, in those final weeks. And, you know, the, the, there was an announcement from the FBI about emails of Hillary Clinton's being found. Um, there was a very aggressive campaign effort by the president, which I think in retrospect was very effective. He had a very consistent closing message he was delivering every night, getting huge audiences for. Um, that's where the Trump campaign wants to be. Uh, and, and they have also been trying to push both their paid media uh, and the president's uh, talking points, what he's saying at these rallies, to focus more on um, what, what a Biden presidency will mean in terms of policy and why voters should be concerned about that. Again, they're going for swing voters who either voted for Trump last time or sympathetic to the Republican Party, if they're not Republicans themselves, who've been turned off by the president's behavior or his handling of COVID over the last uh, five or six months. Um, and they, they think the way to win that back is not talking about Hunter Biden like the president likes to. It's talking about Joe Biden raising your taxes. It's talking about school choice. It's talking about uh, a host of issues that, that concern many voters uh, that the Democratic Party has embraced. We've seen some of the Trump family come in so far, and we'll keep watching to see for more of the arrivals. Um, James Homan, you know, the Comey story and that element really impacted the 2016 race. And we are hearing that President Trump would love to have some other sort of sort of thumb on the scales moment um, where you know law and order officials from his administration come out and make claims or sort of make intimations 
about the Biden families. Let's talk about the, the politics of that and also, you know, how the Biden camp is thinking about that and then whether you think the American public would, would even sort of interpret that in a way that was against Biden. All three of those are great questions. There'll be lots to unpack, and there is certainly a lot of tension between Trump and his FBI director, who he appointed, Chris Wray. Uh, our uh, Washington Post reporting uh, shows that the president is considering getting rid of Wray, just like he got rid of Comey. Uh, right after the election, he's frustrated. Uh, the FBI institutionally is terrified about repeating the mistakes of 2016. They don't like that they seem to be right in the middle of this political contest and they're determined uh, not to this time. Uh, they sent a letter to Ron Johnson, the Trump ally, who's the Republican chairman of the Senate Homeland Security Committee, uh, saying that they would neither confirm nor deny a claim by John Ratcliffe, who's Trump's uh, director of national intelligence, saying that the Hunter hard drive was not Russian disinformation. Uh, but the FBI said that that doesn't mean they're confirming that that's the case. Uh, but then they cited the Justice Department Inspector General report that criticized the way that they weighed in in 2016. So I think just to protect uh, the rule of law, they don't want to be involved in this at all. Donald Trump sees the, the law enforcement apparatus as his. He repeatedly, routinely refers to my Justice Department. Uh, and that's a big break with historical tradition. Uh, that's Trump is also frustrated at Attorney General Bill Barr that uh, John Durham, who's the U.S. Attorney for Connecticut, who was appointed by Trump, is not going to uh, give him scalps, which is the word that the president has been using uh, before the election by going after uh, some of, of Obama administration officials uh, who he perceives as, as his own enemies. The president does. So I think that those two dynamics to answer the third part of your question, mean that if there was some kind of announcement from a Trumpian person like a Ratcliffe, that it would not be greeted the, the same way as it was four years ago, but it certainly could still have an impact. And while Biden does have a lead, uh, you know, the, the polls in a lot of the battleground states, places like Iowa, Ohio, North Carolina, are really too close to call. It is uh, within the margin of error. Biden has uh, an, an advantage, but it's slight. So if if something moved polls 2% or like we were talking about earlier, if it dissuaded some people who maybe uh, are kind of center right, consider themselves sort of conservative, don't like Trump, don't want to vote for him, but aren't sold on Joe Biden. You know, the the idea, the animation that there could be something that, that's being looked into about Biden might cause some of those people to stay home, which is what Trump wants. Uh, and, and, you know, I think that's why the Biden campaign is on edge uh, about Trump manipulating the, the law enforcement apparatus and kind of not having respect for the traditional rule of law function uh, that, that other prior presidents, including Barack Obama, did. Mm. Rhonda Colvin, a moment ago we saw Jill Biden, of course, the wife of Joe Biden. We also saw Melania Trump, the first lady, uh, seated, both wearing masks. Let's talk about what Melania Trump, the first lady, has been going through uh, with her own uh, COVID diagnosis recently. That's right. She was diagnosed shortly after the visit to Cleveland for the first debate, and we later found out that uh, their son, Barron Trump, also had the coronavirus, as well as many uh, staffers in the White House and in the West Wing. And it's so interesting to see the Trump family there. They have their mask on. This is a, is a lot different from what we saw in Cleveland, where they did have their mask on when they walked in. But then we learn a few minutes later that they took them off and did not put them back on, even as uh, the Cleveland Clinic aides asked them to put it back on. Um, this, I, this is the first time we are seeing Melania Trump since um, her battle with COVID, and uh, she looks pretty serious about uh, keeping the mask on and keeping with these regulations. So it seems like the mask politics, because the commission has been so adamant that everybody in attendance wear a mask, and because of the fallout from Cleveland, uh, it seems as if people are responding to that and keeping those masks on. Michael, the absence of the first lady on the campaign trail is certainly notable. It is. She was supposed to go to an event, I think, in Pennsylvania earlier this week uh, and canceled because she still wasn't feeling well. I assume she's tested uh, negative to be at the event uh, now. You know, she she plays a, a sort of symbolic role for Trump on the trail. She doesn't usually speak at events uh, and, and the president can still refer to her. And, and does often at his rallies. Uh, um, so I don't think it's been a big loss. It hasn't really shifted the actual performance of those events. 
But I do think, you know, the president getting back out again uh, uh, on the trail, the first lady showing she is well, them saying Baron Trump is well, uh, does matter for for the president. I mean, he he is running on the on a basically a platform that COVID is behind us, and if they are continuing to suffer from the effects of, the, of an infection, uh, that really undermines their message. Uh, and and so I, I think that's one of the reasons you're you're probably seeing her in the audience tonight. Mm. Uh, James Hellman, we heard contrition from Chris Christie, who contracted coronavirus. He was doing debate prep with the president uh, before the last debate. Um, we obviously have not heard any, any sort of contrition like that from President Trump, and we don't expect to, do we? We don't. And when he was asked about Christie saying he should have worn a mask, Trump said he has to say that, <laughs> which was kind of a, a funny response. Uh, the president is someone who doesn't like to express regret about anything. He sees that as weakness. Uh, and, and it's so striking because even Amy Coney Barrett, uh, the president's Supreme Court nominee and her questions for the record uh, to the Senate that were released this week, uh, declined to, to kind of say that she has any regrets about not wearing a mask or about what was now clearly a super spreader event in the Rose Garden where her nomination was announced. So I think, you know, you, and you saw Obama take a hit at Trump for the, the super spreader event uh, during his rally, his drive-in rally in Philadelphia last night. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, if Biden brought it up as well. Michael, you know, we heard earlier tonight that a reminder that even though the mics will be killed uh, at a certain point after that two minute uh, uninterrupted window that they get to talk, but as our colleague Joyce Coe pointed out, that doesn't mean that the candidates can't hear each other, right? We may not be able to hear it through the microphones, but uh, there are people on stage. The cutting of the mic doesn't cut off their vocal cords, right? So uh, how is the Biden camp thinking about and preparing for potential distractions from Donald Trump that may come, you know, from off stage there, even if it's not through the microphones? Uh, he's been preparing uh, for several days now, which is a marked contrast to the way the president's been preparing for the debate. And I, a big part of those preparations have been figuring out how to deal with these interruptions. Bob Barnes, the former White House counsel, has been playing Trump and, and has been trying to uh, jar and, and you know, get, get Biden's goat. I, you know, one of the concerns the Biden campaign had going into the first debate is that Biden not get rattled. He's he is a, a politician who you know is relatively genteel most of the time, but you come after his family or you question his integrity, he tends to uh, flash some fire. And and you saw a little bit of that uh, at the first debate. Uh, he apologized afterwards for calling the president a clown, said he, he probably shouldn't have said that. Um, and so I'm sure they have drilled over and over again various attacks on Biden's family, on Hunter Biden, um, at, to make sure that that uh, the vice president doesn't lose his cool, or or if he does lose his cool, does it in a constructive way for the campaign and, and not a destructive way. James, does the Biden campaign see that as an opportunity? I mean, you know, the, the calling him a clown or saying shut up and things like that. While there's some question about the decorum of that, just like Trump supporters like to see him going full throttle and interrupting, Biden supporters and Democrats were thrilled to hear someone sort of finally say what they'd been thinking. Yeah, absolutely, Libby. And you have to do both. You have to kind of project decency and breaking the fever and how we're going to, uh, you know, work across the aisle and return bipartisan comedy. But you also want to show people that you're a fighter and that, you know, if you if you can stand up to Donald Trump, you can also stand up to Vladimir Putin or Xi Jinping. And uh, and a lot of the 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 blue collar, non college educated uh, voters in in places like Western Michigan and Ohio and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania want a president who's a fighter and kind of uh, and so that's the balancing act is you can't just totally be cool as a cucumber. That was always one of Obama's problems is that uh, there were there were voters who didn't feel like he would show enough emotion. Uh, and so I think Biden needs to do it both ways. But Shearer's right that he, they've drilled into him to be as disciplined and cool as possible. Thanks so much to James Homan, also Michael Shearer and Rhonda Colvin. The second and final presidential debate of the 2020 election cycle is a big out to begin. Stay with us for after the debate for analysis and conversation with The Washington Post. Let's go to Kristen Welker. Good evening from Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm Kristen Welker of NBC News, and I welcome you to the final 2020 presidential debate between President Donald J. Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden. 
Tonight's debate is sponsored by the Commission on Presidential Debates. It is conducted under health and safety protocols designed by the Commission's health security advisor. The audience here in the hall has promised to remain silent. No cheers, boos, or other interruptions, except right now, as we welcome to the stage former Vice President Joe Biden and President Donald J. Trump. And I do want to say a very good evening to both of you. This debate will cover six major topics. At the beginning of each section, each candidate will have two minutes uninterrupted to answer my first question. The debate commission will then turn on their microphone only when it is their turn to answer. And the commission will turn it off exactly when the two minutes have expired. After that, both microphones will remain on. But on behalf of the voters, I'm going to ask you to please speak one at a time. The goal is for you to hear each other and for the American people to hear every word of what you both have to say. And so with that, if you're ready, let's start. And we will begin with the fight against the coronavirus. President Trump, the first question is for you. The country is heading into a dangerous new phase. More than 40,000 Americans are in the hospital tonight with COVID, including record numbers here in Tennessee. And since the two of you last shared a stage, 16,000 Americans have died from COVID. So please be specific. How would you lead the country during this next stage of the coronavirus crisis? Two minutes uninterrupted. So as you know, 2.2 million people modeled out were expected to die. We closed up the greatest economy in the world in order to fight this horrible disease that came from China. It's a worldwide pandemic. It's all over the world. You see the spikes in Europe and many other places right now. Uh, if you notice, the mortality rate is down 85%. Uh, the excess mortality rate is way down and much lower than almost any other country. And we're fighting it, and we're fighting it hard. There is a spike. There was a spike in Florida, and it's now gone. There was a very big spike in Texas. It's now gone. There was a very big spike in Arizona. It's now gone. And there are some spikes and surges in other places. They will soon be gone. We have a vaccine that's coming. It's ready. It's going to be announced within weeks, and it's going to be delivered. We have uh, Operation Warp Speed, which is the military is going to distribute the vaccine. I can tell you from personal experience that uh, I was in the hospital. I had it. And I got better, and I will tell you that uh, I had something that they gave me, a therapeutic, I guess they would call it. Some people could say it was a cure. But uh, I was in for a short period of time, and I got better very fast, or I wouldn't be here tonight. And now they say I'm immune. Whether it's four months or a lifetime, nobody's been able to say that, but I'm immune. Uh, more and more people are uh, getting better. We have uh, a problem that's a worldwide problem. This is a worldwide problem. But I've been congratulated by the heads of many countries on what we've been able to do. Uh, with the, if you, if you take a look at what we've done in terms of goggles and masks and gowns and everything else, and in particular ventilators, we're now making ventilators all over the world, thousands and thousands a month, distributing them all over the world. It will go away, and as I say, we're rounding the turn, we're rounding the corner. It's going away. Okay, former Vice President Biden, to you, how would you lead the country out of this crisis? You have two minutes uninterrupted. 220,000 Americans dead. If you hear nothing else I say tonight, hear this. Anyone who's responsible for not taking control, in fact, not saying I'm, I take no responsibility initially, anyone who's responsible for that many deaths should not remain as President of the United States of America. We're in a situation where there are a thousand deaths a day now, a thousand deaths a day. And there are over 70,000 new cases per day. Compared to what's going on in Europe, as the New England Medical Journal said, they're starting from a very low rate. We're starting from a very high rate. The expectation is we'll have another 200,000 Americans dead by time between now and the end of the year. If we just wore these masks, the President's own advisors have told them, we could save 100,000 lives. 
And we're in a circumstance where the President thus far and still has no plan, no comprehensive plan. What I would do is make sure we have everyone encouraged to wear a mask all the time. I would make sure we move in the direction of rapid testing, investing in rapid testing. I would make sure that we set up national standards as to how to open up schools and open up businesses so they can be safe and give them the wherewithal, the financial resources to be able to do that. We're in a situation now where the New England Medical Journal, one of the serious, most serious journals in the, in the whole world, said for the first time ever that this, the way this president has responded to this crisis has been absolutely tragic. And so, folks, I will take care of this. I will end this. I will make sure we have a plan. President Trump, I'd like to follow up with you and your comments. You talked about taking a therapeutic. I assume you're referencing Regeneron. You also said a vaccine will be coming within weeks. Yes. Is that a guarantee? Is, no, it's is not this... a guarantee, but it will be by the end of the year. But I think it has a good chance. There are two companies, I think, within a matter of weeks, and it will be distributed very quickly. Can you tell us which companies? Uh, Johnson & Johnson is doing very well. Moderna is doing very well. Pfizer is doing very well. And we have numerous others. And then we also have others that we're working on very closely with other countries, in particular Europe. Let me follow up with you, and because this is new information, you have said a vaccine is coming soon within weeks now. Your own officials say it could take well into 2021 at the earliest for enough Americans to get vaccinated. And even then, they say the country will be wearing masks and distancing into 2022. Is your timeline realistic? No, I think my timeline is going to be more accurate. I don't know that they're counting on the military the way I do, but we have our generals lined up, one in particular that's the head of logistics. And this is a very easy distribution for him. He's ready to go as soon as we have the vaccine. And we expect to have 100 million vials. As soon as we have the vaccine, he's ready to go. Vice President Biden, your reaction, and just 40 percent of Americans say they would definitely agree to take a coronavirus vaccine if it was approved by the government. What steps would you take to give Americans confidence in a uh, vaccine if it were approved? Make sure it's totally transparent. Have the scientists of the world see it, know it, look at it. Go through all the processes. And by the way, he's, this is the same fellow who told you this is going to end by Easter last time. This is the same fellow who told you that, don't worry, we're going to end this by the summer. We're about to go into a dark winter, a dark winter. And he has no clear plan, and there's no prospect that there's going to be a vaccine available for the majority of the American people before the middle of next year. President Trump, your reaction, he says you have no plan. I don't no think plan. we're going to have a dark winter and at all. We're opening up our country. We've learned and studied and understand the disease, which we didn't at the beginning. When I closed and banned China from coming in heavily infected and then ultimately Europe, but China was in January. Months later, he was saying I was xenophobic. I did it too soon. Now he's saying, oh, I should have, uh, I should have you know, moved quicker. But he didn't move quicker. He was months behind me, many months behind me. And frankly, he ran the H1N1 swine flu, and it was a total disaster, far less lethal, but it was a total disaster. Had that had this kind of numbers, 700,000 people would be dead right now, but it was a far less lethal disease. Uh, look, his own person who ran that for him, who, as you know, was his uh, chief of staff, said, it was catastrophic. It was horrible. We didn't know what we were doing. Now he comes up and he tells us how to do this. Also, everything that he said about the way every single move that he said we should make, that's what we've done. We've done all of it. But he was way behind us. Vice President Biden, your response? My response is he is xenophobic, but not because he shut down access from China. And he did it late after 40 countries had already done that. In addition to that, what he did, he made sure that we had 44 people that were in there in China, trying to get to Wuhan to determine what exactly the source was. What did the president say in January? He said, no, he said, this is, he's being transparent. The president of China is being transparent. We owe him a debt of gratitude. We, ought to, we have to thank him. And, and then what happened was, we started talking about using the Defense Act to make sure we go out and get whatever is needed out there to protect people. And again, I go back to this. He had nothing, he did virtually nothing. And then he gets out of the hospital and he talks about, we're, this is, oh, don't worry, it's all, all gonna be over soon. Come on, 
There's not another serious scientist in the world who thinks it's going to be over soon. President Trump, your reaction? I say over soon. I say we're learning to live with it. We have no choice. We can't lock ourselves up in a basement like Joe does. He has the <laughs> he has the ability to lock himself up. I don't know. He's obviously made a lot of money someplace, but he has this thing about living in a basement. People can't do that. By the way, I, as the president, couldn't do that. I'd love to put myself in the basement or in a beautiful room in the White House and go away for a year and a half until it disappears. I can't do that. And, Kirsten, every, t every meeting I had, every meeting I had, and I'd meet a lot of families, including Gold Star families and military families, every meeting I had, and I had to meet them. I had to. It would be horrible to have canceled everything. I said, you know, this is dangerous. And you catch it. And, you know, I caught it. I learned a lot. I learned a lot. Great doctors, great hospitals. And now I recovered. 99.9 of young people recover. 99% of people recover. We have to recover. We can't close up our nation. We have to open our school, and we can't close up our nation, or you're not going to have a nation. And of course, the CDC has said young people can get sick with COVID-19 and can pass it. Vice President Biden, I want to talk broadly about strategy, though. You have can I respond to that? 30 seconds, please, For and then seconds. I have a question. No, number one, he says that we're, uh, you know, we're learning to live with it. People are learning to die with it. You folks home will have an empty chair at the kitchen table this morning. That man or wife going to bed tonight and reaching over to try to touch their out of habit where their wife or husband was is gone. Learning to live with it. Come on. We're dying with it because he has never said, as you said, it's dangerous. When's the last time? Is it really dangerous still? Are we dangerous? You tell the people it's dangerous now? What should they do about the danger? And you say, I take no responsibility. Let me talk about your two Excuse me, I take, very full, I take full responsibility. It's not my fault that it came here. It's China's fault. And you know what? It's not Joe's fault that it came here either. It's China's fault. They kept it from going into the rest of China for the most part, but they didn't keep it from coming out to the world, including Europe and ourselves. Vice President Biden. The fact is that when we knew it was coming, when it hit, what happened? What did the president say? He said, don't worry, it's going to go away. Be gone by Easter. Don't worry. The warm weather. Don't worry. Maybe inject bleach. He said he was kidding when he said that. But a lot of people thought it was serious. A whole range of things the president has said. Even today, he thinks we are in control. We're about to lose 200,000 more people. President Trump. Look, perhaps just to finish this, I was kidding on that. But just to finish this, when I closed, he said I shouldn't have closed. And that went on for months. What Nancy Pelosi said the same thing. She was dancing on the streets in Chinatown in San Francisco. But when I closed, he said, this is a terrible thing, you xenophobic. I think he called me racist, even. And because I was closing it to China. Now he says I should have closed it earlier. It just, Joe, it doesn't work. I didn't say either of those things. You certainly did. You certainly and I did. did. I okay. talked about a xenophobia in a different context. It wasn't about closing the border to Chinese coming to the United States. All right, I want to talk about both of your different strategies to handle. He thought this. I shouldn't have closed the border. Well, let's... That's obvious. Is that... Do you want to respond to that quickly, Vice President no. Biden? Okay. Let's talk about your different strategies toward dealing with this. Mr. Vice President, you suggested you would support new shutdowns if scientists recommended it. What do you say to Americans who are fearful that the cost of shutdowns, the impact on the economy, the higher rates of hunger, depression, domestic and substance abuse outweighs the risk of exposure to the virus? What I would say is I'm going to shut down the virus, not the country. It's his ineptitude that caused the, virus, caused the country to have to shut down in large part. Why businesses have gone under, why schools are closed, why so many people have lost their living, and why they're concerned. Those other concerns are real. That's why he should have been, instead of in a sand trap in his golf course, he should have been negotiating with Nancy Pelosi and the rest of the Democrats and Republicans about what to do about the acts they were passing for billions of dollars to make sure people had the capacity. But you haven't ruled out more shutdowns. Well, no, I, I'm not shutting down the name, but there are, look, you need standards. The standard is if you have a reproduction rate in a community that's above a certain level, everybody says, slow up, more social distancing, do not open bars and do not open gymnasiums, do not open until you get this under control, under more control. 
But when you do open, give the people the capacity to be able to open and have the capacity to do it safely. For example, schools. Schools, they need a lot of money to open. They need to deal with ventilation systems. They need to deal with smaller classes, more teachers, more pods. And he's refused to support that money, or at least up to now. Let's talk about schools. President well, Trump, I, I think we have to respond, if I might. Please, and then I have a follow-up. Thank you, and I appreciate that. Look, all he does is talk about shutdowns, but forget about him. His Democrat governors, Cuomo in New York, you look at what's going on in California, you look at Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Democrats, Democrats all, they're shut down so tight and they're dying. They're dying. And he supports all these people. All he talks about is shutdowns. No, we're not going to shut down and we have to open our schools. And it's like, as an example, I have a young son. He also tested positive. By the time I spoke to the doctor the second time, he was fine. It just went away. Young people, I guess it's their immune system. Let me follow up with you, President Trump. You've demanded schools open in person and insist they can do it safely. But just yesterday, Boston became the latest city to move its public school system entirely online after a coronavirus spike. What is your message to parents who worry that sending their children to school will endanger not only their kids, but also their teachers and okay. families? I want to open the schools. Uh, the transmittal rate to the teachers is uh, very small, but I want to open the schools. We have to open our country. We're not going to have a country. You can't do this. We can't keep this country closed. This is a massive country with a massive economy. People are losing their jobs. They're committing suicide. There's depression, alcohol, drugs at a level that nobody's ever seen before. There's abuse, tremendous abuse. We have to open our country. You know, I've said it often. The cure cannot be worse than the problem itself. Vice and President. that's what's happening. And he wants to close down. He'll close down the country if one person in our, in our massive bureaucracy says we should close it down. Vice President Biden, your Simply response. not true. We ought to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. We ought to be able to safely open, but would they need resources to open? You need to be able to, for example, if you're going to open a business, have social distancing within the business. You need to have, if you have a restaurant, you need to have plexiglass dividers so people cannot infect one another. You need to be in a position where you can take testing rapidly and know whether a person is, in fact, infected. You need to be able to trace. You need to be able to provide the, all the resources that are needed to do this. And that is not inconsistent with saying that what we're going to make sure that we open safely. And by the way, all you teachers out there, not that many of you are going to die, so don't worry about it. So don't worry about it. Come on. President Trump, let me follow up with you quickly. By the way, um, I will say this. If you go and look at what's happened to New York, it's a ghost town. It's a ghost town. And when you talk about plexiglass, these are restaurants that are dying. These are businesses with no money. Putting up plexiglass is unbelievably expensive, and it's not the answer. I mean, you're going to sit there in a cubicle wrapped around with plastic. It's These are businesses that are dying, Joe. You can't do that to people. You Which just you can't. Can. Take a look at New York and what's happened to my wonderful city for, for so many years. I loved it. It was vibrant. It's dying. Everyone's leaving New York. Take a look Vice at President what New York has done in terms of the turning the curve down in terms of the number of people dying. And I don't look at this in terms of the way he does. Blue states and red states. They're all the United States. And look at the states that are having such a spike in the coronavirus. They're the red states. They're the states in the Midwest. They're the states in the upper Midwest. That's where the spike is occurring significantly. But they're all Americans. They're all Americans. And what we have to do is say, wear these masks, number one. Make sure we get the help that the businesses need that has money's already been passed to do that. It's been out there since the beginning of the summer, and nothing's happened. President, New York has lost more than 40,000 people, 11,000 people in nursing homes. President Trump, what when about— When you say spike, take a look at what's happening in Pennsylvania, where they've had it closed. Take a look at what's happening with your friend in Michigan, where her husband's the only one allowed to do anything. It's been like a prison. Now, it was just ruled unconstitutional. Take a look at North Carolina. They're having spikes, and they've been closed and they're getting killed financially. We can't let that happen, Joe. You can't let that happen. We have to open up, and we understand the disease. We have to protect our seniors. We have to protect our elderly. We have to protect 
especially our seniors with heart problems and diabetes problems, and we will protect them. We have the best testing in the world by far. That's why we have so many cases. Let me follow up with you shows. before we move on to our next section. President Trump, this week you called Dr. Anthony Fauci the nation's best-known infectious disease expert, quote, a disaster. You described him and other medical experts as, quote, idiots. If you're not listening to them, who are you listening to let, as you fight me, this? I'm listening to all of them, including Anthony. I get along very well with Anthony. But he did say, don't wear masks. He did say, as you know, this is not going to be a problem. Uh, I think he's a Democrat, but that's okay. He said, this is not going to be a problem. We are not going to have a problem at all. When Joe says that I said, Anthony Fauci said, and others, and many others, and I'm not knocking him a lot. Nobody knew. Look, nobody knew what this thing was. Nobody knew where it was coming from, what it was. We've learned a lot. But Anthony said, don't wear masks. Now he wants to wear masks. Anthony also said, if you look back, exact words. Here's his exact words. This is no problem. This is going to go away soon. So he's allowed to make mistakes. He happens to be a good person. Vice President right. Biden, your response quickly, and then we're going to move on to the next section. My response is that think about what the president knew in January and didn't tell the American people. He was told this was a serious virus that spread in the air, and it was much worse than, much worse than the flu. He went on record and said to one of your colleagues, recorded, that in fact he knew how dangerous it was, but he didn't want to tell us. He didn't want to tell us because he didn't want us to panic. He didn't want us, Americans don't panic. He panicked. But guess what? In the meantime, we find out in the New York Times the other day that, in fact, his folks went to Wall Street and said this is a really dangerous thing. And a memo out of that meeting, not from his administration, but from some of the brokers, said, sell short because we've got to get moving. It's a dangerous problem. Well, this is I'm going to give you 30 I, seconds to respond, and then we're uh, the going to move on. The Wall Street I don't know. Somebody went to Wall Street. You're the one that takes all the money from Wall Street. I don't take it. Jay, I have. You, you have raised a lot of money, tremendous amounts of money. And every time you raise money, deals are made, Joe. I could raise so much more money oh. as president and as somebody that knows most of those people. I could call the heads of Wall Street, the heads of every company in America. I would blow away every record, but I don't want to do that because it puts me in a bad position. And then you bring up Wall Street. You shouldn't be bringing up Wall Street because you're the one that takes the money from Wall Street, not me. My I, could, I could blow away your records that, like, you wouldn't believe. We don't need money. We have plenty of money. In fact, we beat Hillary Clinton with a tiny fraction of the money that she was able to All right, to gentlemen, we're going to move on. Don't tell me about Average contribution, $43. All right, we're going to move on to our next section, which is national security. And I do want to start with the security of our elections and some breaking news from overnight. Just last night, top intelligence officials confirmed again that both Russia and Iran are working to influence this election. Both countries have obtained U.S. voter registration information, these officials say, and Iran sent intimidating messages to Florida voters. This question goes to you, Mr. Vice President. What would you do to put an end to this threat? You have two minutes uninterrupted. I made it clear, and I ask everyone else to take the pledge, I made it clear that any country, no matter who it is, that interferes in American elections will pay a price. They will pay a price. And it's been overwhelmingly clear this election, I won't even get into the last one, this election, that Russia has been involved, China has been involved to some degree, and now we learn that, that, uh, that uh, Iran is involved. They will pay a price if I'm elected. They're interfering with American sovereignty. That's what's going on right now. They're interfering with American sovereignty. And to the best of my knowledge, I don't think the president said anything to Putin about it. I don't think he's stalking them a lot. I don't think he said a word. I don't know why he hadn't said a word to Putin about it. And I don't know what he has recently said, if anything, to the Iranians. My guess is he'd probably be more outspoken with regard to the Iranians. But the point is this, folks. We are in a situation where we have foreign company, countries trying to interfere in the outcome of our election. His old, own national security advisor told him that what is happening with his buddy — well, I won't — I should — well, I will. His buddy, Rudy Giuliani, he's being used as a Russian pawn. He's being fed information that is Russian, that is not true. And then what happens? Nothing happens. And then you find out that everything that's going on here about Russia is wanting to make sure that I do not get elected the next president of the United States because they know I know them and they know me. 
I don't understand why this president is unwilling to take on Putin when he's actually paying bounties to kill American soldiers in Afghanistan, when he's engaged in activities that are trying to destabilize all of NATO. I don't know why he doesn't do it, but it's worth asking the question, why isn't that being done? Any country that interferes with us will, in fact, pay a price because they're affecting our sovereignty. President Trump, same question to you. Let me, let me ask the yeah. question. You're going to have two minutes yeah. to respond. For two elections in a row now, there has been substantial interference from foreign adversaries. What would you do in your next term to put an end to this? Two minutes uninterrupted. Well, let me respond to the first part, as Joe answered. Joe got $3.5 million from Russia, and it came through Putin because he was very friendly with the former mayor of Moscow, and it was the mayor of Moscow's wife. And you got $3.5 million. Your family got $3.5 million. And you know, someday you're going to have to explain why did you get three and a half. I never got any money from Russia. I don't get money from Russia. Now, about your thing last night, I knew all about that. And through John, who is John Retliff, who is fantastic, DNI, he said the one thing that's common to both of them, they both want you to lose because there has been nobody tougher to Russia with between the sanctions, nobody tougher than me on Russia. Between the sanctions, between all of what I've done with NATO, you know, I've got the NATO countries to put up an extra $130 billion, going to $420 billion a year. That's to guard against Russia. I sold, while he was selling pillows and sheets, I sold tank busters to Ukraine. There has been nobody tougher than, on Russia than Donald Trump. And I'll tell you, they were so bad. They took over the, the submarine port. You remember that very well. During your term, during you and Barack Obama, they took over a big part of what should have been Ukraine. You handed it to them. But you were getting a lot of money from Russia. They were paying you a lot of money, and they probably still are. But now, with what came out today, it's even worse. All of the emails, the emails, the horrible emails of the kind of money that you were raking in, you and your family, and, Joe, you were vice president when some of this was happening, and it should have never happened. And I think you owe an explanation to the American people. Why is it somebody just had a news conference a little while ago who was essentially supposed to work with you and your family, but what he said was damning. And regardless of me, I think you have to clean it up and talk to the American people. Maybe you can do it right now. Vice President Biden, you may respond in 30 seconds. Here. And then I do I, want to follow up on the election security. I have not taken a penny from any foreign source ever in my life. We learned that this president paid 50 times the tax in China, has a secret bank account with China, does business in China, and in fact is talking about me taking money. I have not taken a single penny from any country whatsoever, ever. Number one. Number two. This is a president. I have released all of my tax returns. 22 years. Go look at them. 22 years of my tax return. You have not released a single solitary year of your tax return. What are you hiding? Why are you unwilling? The foreign countries are paying you a lot. Russia's paying you a lot. China's paying you a lot. And your hotels and all your businesses all around the country, all around the world. And China's building a new road to a new ga a, a, a golf course you have overseas. So what's going on here? Why don't release your tax return or stop talking about corruption? President Trump, your response. First of all, I called my accountants, underwrote it. I'm going to release them as soon as we can. I want to do it. And it'll show how successful, how great this company is. But much more importantly than that, people were saying $750. I asked them a week ago, I said, what did I pay? They said, sir, you prepaid tens of millions of dollars. I prepaid my tax. Tens over the last number of years. Tens of millions of dollars I prepaid. Because at some point they think it's an estimate. They think I may have to pay tax. So I already prepaid it. Nobody told me that. Did your account Nobody tell told you, you that. You Excuse them? me. And it wasn't written whenever they write this. They keep talking about $750, which I think is a filing fee. But let me just tell you. I prepaid millions and millions of dollars in taxes, number one. Number two, I don't make money from China. You do. I don't make money from Ukraine. You do. I don't make money from Russia. You made three and a half million dollars, Joe, and your son gave you. They even have a statement that we have to give 10 percent to the big man. You're the big man, I think. I don't know. Maybe you're not. But you're the big man, I think. 
Your son said we have to give 10% to the big men. Joe, what's that all about? It's terrible. All right, gentlemen, I it's want to a, ask you both some questions about all of this. To that. I'm going to let you both respond very quickly. You just said you spoke to your accountant yes. about potentially releasing your taxes. Did he tell you when you can release them? Do you as have a the deadline for when you're going to release them? I to get the American treated people? worse than the Tea Party got treated because I have a lot have of people in there. Right. Deep down in the IRS, they treat me horribly. We made a deal, it was all settled until I decide to run for president. I get treated very badly by the IRS, very unfairly. But we had a deal all done. As soon as we're completed with the deal, I want to release it. But I have paid millions and millions of dollars, and I, it's worse than paying. I paid in advance. It's called prepaying your taxes. Okay. I paid in advance. I want to ask you sure. both about questions regarding your potential foreign entanglements and questions that have been raised to give you both a chance Some to talk about, about this more broadly. Respond very quickly, and then I'll get to my question. Why did he, he's been saying this for four years? Show us. Just show us. Stop playing around. You've been saying for four Everybody years you're going to release your taxes. Nobody knows it, Mr. President. What they do okay. know is you're not paying your taxes or you're paying taxes that are so low. When last time he said what he paid, he said, I only pay that little because I'm smart. I know how to game the system. Come on. Come on, folks. So, quickly, President Trump, and then I want to get to two questions to both of you sure. on this. I was put through a phony witch hunt for three years. It started before I even got elected. They spied on my campaign. No president should ever have to go through what I went through. Let me just say this. Mueller and 18 angry Democrats and FBI agents all over the place spent $48 million. They went through everything I had, including my tax returns, and they found absolutely no collusion and nothing wrong. Forty-eight million. I guarantee you, if I spent one million on you, Joe, I could find plenty wrong. Because right. the kind of things that you've done and the kind of monies that your family has taken, I mean, your brother made money in Iraq, me millions of dollars. Your other bro brother made a fortune. And it's all through you, Joe. And they say you get some of it. And you do live very well. You have houses all over the place. You live very well. All right, gentlemen, let me just ask oh, some goodness. questions about all of this broadly. Vice President Biden, there have been questions about the work your son has done in China and for Ukraine an energy company when you were vice president. In retrospect, was anything about those relationships inappropriate or unethical? Nothing was unethical. Here's what the deal. With regard to Ukraine, we had this whole question about whether or not, because he was on the board, I later learned of a Burisma, a company, that somehow I had done something wrong. Yet every single solitary person when he was going through his impeachment testifying under oath who worked for him, said, I did my job impeccably. I carried out U.S. policy. Not one single solitary thing was out of line. Not a single thing, number one. Number two, the guy who got in trouble in Ukraine was this guy trying to bribe the Ukrainian government to say something negative about me, which they would not do and did not do because it never, ever, ever happened. My son has not made money in terms of this thing about, uh, what are you talking about, China. I have not had, a, the only guy made money from China is this guy. He's the only one. Nobody else has made money from China. Never President Trump, deal, deal with let, China. Me, let me ask way, my question to you. But could I just, we'll, one, one thing? Very quickly. His son didn't have a job for a long time, was sadly no longer in the military service. I won't get into that. And he didn't have a job. As soon as he became vice president, Barisma, not the best look, not the best reputation in the world. I hear they paid him 183,000 a month. Listen to this, 183, and they gave him a three million dollar upfront payment. All right, and he had no I, energy. I'm going to let the vice president That's respond to that quickly, and then I need to get to a question to you. Very no quickly, basis for president. that. Everybody investigated that. No one said anything he did was wrong in Ukraine. Okay, President Trump, this is for you. Since you took office, you've never divested from your business. You've personally promoted your properties abroad. A report this week, which was referenced, does indicate that your company has a bank account in China. So how can voters know that you don't have any foreign conflicts of interest? I have many bank accounts, and they're all listed, and they're all over the place. I mean, I was a businessman doing business. The bank account you're referring to, which is everybody knows about it, it's listed. The bank account was in 2013. That's what it was. It was opened and it was closed in 2015, I believe. And then I decided, because I was going to do, I was thinking about doing a deal in China, like 
millions of other people. I was thinking about it, and I decided I'm not going to do it. Didn't like it. I decided not to do it. Had an account open, and I closed it. Okay. Excuse me. And then, unlike him, where he's vice president and he does business, I then decided to run for president after that. That was before. So I closed it before I even ran for president, let alone became president. Big difference. He is the vice president of the United States, and his son, his brother, and his other brother are getting rich. They're like a vacuum cleaner. They're sucking okay, up president money every Trump, place Thank you. We do Not need to true. move on. I do want to ask you, uh, Vice President Biden, about China. Let's talk about China more broadly. There have, of course, President Trump has said that they should pay for not being fully transparent in regards to the coronavirus. If you were president, would you make China pay? And please be specific, what would that look like? What I'd make China do is play by the international rules, not like he has done. He has caused the deficit of China to go up, not down, with China, up, not down. We are making sure that in order to do business in China, you have to give all your intellectual property. You have to get a, have a partner in China. It's 51 percent. We would not do that at all, number one. Number two, we're in a situation where China would have to play by the rules internationally as well. When I met with Xi that, and uh, when I was still vice president, he said, we're setting up air identification zones in the, in the South China Sea. You can't fly through them. I said, we're going to fly through them. We just flew B-52, B-1 bombers through it. We're not going to pay attention. They have to play by the rules. And what's he do? He embraces guys like the thugs like in North Korea and, and, uh, and the Chinese president and Putin and others. And he pokes his finger in the eye of all of our friends, all of our allies. We make up only, we're, we're 25 percent, 25 percent of the world's economy. We need to be having the rest of our friends with us saying to China, these are the rules. You play by them or you're going to pay the price for not paying by them economically. That's the way I will run it. And that's what we did in upholding steel tariffs and a range of other things when we were president and vice president. All right. Let's talk oh, about oh, North oh, Korea. Oh, oh, Let, excuse me. No, I have to yes. respond to that. Okay. Very quickly, and then we're going to move on to North Korea. with a billion Korea. and a half dollars from China to Not manage after true. spending 10 minutes in office and being in Air Force Two, number one. Number two, there's a very strong email talking about your family wanting to make $10 million a year for introductions. President Trump, on China Not policy, true. though, what no, specifically no, are you going to do? What specifically are you going to do to make China pay? You've said you're going First to make all, them pay. First of all, China is paying. They're paying billions and billions of dollars. I just gave $28 New billion. Dollars New sanctions? I just gave $28 billion to our farmers. Taxpayers' China, money. It's what? Taxpayers' money. Didn't no, come no, from yeah, China. You know the taxpayers? It's called China. China Not paid true. $28 billion, And you know what they did to pay it, Joe? They devalued their currency, and they also paid up. And you know who got the money? Our farmers, our great farmers, because they were targeted. You never charged them anything. Also, I charged them 25 percent on dumped steel because they were killing our steel industry. We were not going to have a steel industry. Okay. And now we have a steel okay. industry. Okay. Vice President Biden, your response, please. My response is, look, this isn't about re — there's a reason why he's bringing up all this malarkey. There's a reason for it. He doesn't want to talk about the, the, the substantive issues. It's not about his family and my family. It's about your family. And your family's hurting badly. If you're making less than — if you're a middle-class family, you're getting hurt badly right now. You're sitting at the kitchen table this morning deciding, well, we can't get new tires or they're bald because we have to wait another month or so. Or are we going to be able to pay the mortgage? Or who's going to tell her she can't go back to, to community college? They're the decisions you're making in the middle-class families like I grew up in Scranton and Claymont. They're in trouble. We should be talking about your families, but that's the last thing he wants to talk about. I want to, I want to talk statement. about North Korea. Excuse me, just I do want to turn to — 10 seconds, Mr. President, that's 10 seconds. That's a typical seconds. political statement. Let's get off this China thing, and then he looks. The family, around the table, everything. Just right. a typical politician when I see that. Let's talk I'm about North Korea. I'm not a typical Korea politician. Okay, President that's why I got elected. That let's was, talk Let's about get off the subject of China. Let's talk around — sitting around the table. All right. Come on, Joe, you can do better. We're going to talk about North Korea now. President Trump, you've met with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un three times. You've talked about your beautiful letters with him. You've touted the fact that there hasn't been a war or a long-range missile test. And yet North Korea recently rolled out its biggest ever intercontinental ballistic missile and continues to develop its nuclear arsenal. Do you see that as a betrayal of the relationship you no. forged? Just 30 seconds here because we need to get on to the next So one. when I met with Barack Obama, we sat in the White House. 
right at the beginning, had a great conversation. It was supposed to be 15 minutes, and it was well over an hour. He said, the biggest problem we have with North is North Korea. He indicated, we will be in a war with North Korea. Guess what? It would be a nuclear war. And he does have plenty of nuclear capability. In the meantime, I have a very good relationship with him. Different kind of a guy, but he probably thinks the same thing about me. We have a different kind of a relationship. We have a very good relationship, and there's no war. And, you know, about oh, two months ago, he broke into a certain area. They said, oh, there's going to be trouble. I said, no, they're not, because he's not going to do that. And I was right. Look, instead of being in a war where millions of people, Seoul, you know, is 25 miles away, millions and millions, 32 million people in Seoul, millions of people would be okay. dead right now. President we Trump, don't have that's a war, 30 and seconds. Thank you. Vice President Biden, to you, North Korea conducted four nuclear tests under the Obama administration. Why do you think you would be able to rein in this persistent threat? Right because now? I'd make it clear, which we were making clear to China, they had to be part of the deal because here's the re I made it clear and as a spokesperson of the administration when I went to China that they said, why are you moving your missile defense up so close? Why are you moving more forces here? Why are you continuing to do uh, um, uh, m military maneuvers with South Korea. I said, because North Korea is a problem, and we're going to continue to do it so we can control them. We're going to make sure we can control them and make sure they cannot hurt us. And so if you want to do something about it, step up and help. If not, it's going to continue. What has he done? He's legitimized North Korea. He's talked about his good buddy, who's a thug, a thug, and he talks about how we're better off. And they are, have much more capable missiles, able to reach U.S. territory much more easily than ever did before. Let me follow up with you, Vice President Biden. You've said you wouldn't meet with Kim Jong-un without preconditions. Are there any conditions under which you would meet with him? On the condition that he would agree that he would be drawing down his nuclear capacity to get that the Korean Peninsula should be nuclear-free zone. All right, let's move on to American families. Kristen, they tried Very to quickly, meet with 10 him. Seconds, President. They tried to meet with him. He I wouldn't didn't. do it. He didn't like Obama. He didn't like him. He wouldn't do it. Okay, I got to give a him a chance to respond to that he before we move do on. It. You and know that's I... okay. You know what? North Korea, we're not in a war. We have a good relationship. You know, people don't understand. Having a good relationship Trump, with leaders of on, other countries is a, a good of thing. We have a lot of questions to get yes, to. Not Your response. Like saying we had a good relationship with Hitler before he, in fact, invaded Europe, the rest of Europe. Come on. Okay. The reason he would not meet with President Obama is because President Obama said, we're going to talk about denuclearization. We're not going to legitimize you, and we're going to continue to put stronger and stronger sanctions on you. That's why he wouldn't meet with us. All right, let's and it didn't move happen. on. Let's Excuse move me. on and talk he about American families. He left me a mess, Kristen. President Trump. Okay, we they do need to move on. They left me a mess. North Korea was a mess. We and in fact, if you so remember the first two or three months, tonight, there was a very Trump. dangerous period of my first three months before we sort of worked things out a little bit. Okay. There was a very day. They left us a mess, and Obama would be, I think. The first to say it was the single biggest problem he thought that our country. Okay, would. let's move on to American families and the economy. One of the issues that's most important to them is health care, as you both know. Today, there was a key vote on a new Supreme Court Justice, Amy Coney Barrett, and health care is at the center of her confirmation fight. Over 20 million Americans get their health insurance through the Affordable Care Act. It's headed to the Supreme Court, and your administration, Mr. President, is advocating for the court to overturn it. If the Supreme Court does overturn that law, those 20 million Americans could lose their health insurance almost overnight. So what would you do if those people have their health insurance taken away? You have two minutes uninterrupted. Sure. First of all, I've already done something that nobody thought was possible. Through the legislature, I terminated the individual mandate. That is the worst part of Obamacare, as we call it. The individual mandate where you have to pay a fortune for the privilege of not having to pay for bad health insurance. I terminated. It. It's gone. Now it's in court, because Obamacare is no good. But then I made a decision. Run it as well as you can to my people, great people. Run it as well as you can. I could have gone the other route and made everybody very unhappy. They ran it. Uh, premiums are down. Everything's down. Here's the problem. No matter how well you run it, it's no good. What we'd like to do is terminate it. We have the individual mandate done. I don't know that it's going to work. If we don't win, we will have to run it, and we'll have Obamacare, but it'll be better run. But it no longer is Obamacare, because without the individual mandate, it's much different. Pre-existing conditions will always stay. What I would like to do is a much better health care, much better, 
will always protect people with pre-existing. So I'd like to terminate Obamacare, come up with a brand new, beautiful health care. The Democrats will do it because there'll be tremendous pressure on them, and we might even have the House by that time. And I think we are going to win the House, okay? You'll see, but I think we're going to win the House. But come up with a better health care, always protecting people with pre-existing conditions. And one thing very important, we have 180 million people out there that have great private health care far more than we're talking about with Obamacare. Joe Biden is going to terminate all of those policies. These are people that love their health care, people that have been successful, middle-income people, been successful. They have 180 million plans, 180 million people, families. Under what he wants to do, which will basically be socialized medicine, he won't even have a choice, they want to terminate 180 million plans. We have done an incredible job on health care. And we're going to do even better. Okay, Let Vice President Biden, yes, this is for you. Your health care plan calls for building on Obamacare. So my question is, what is your plan if the law is ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court? You have two minutes uninterrupted. What I'm going to do is pass Obamacare with a public option. It'll become Biden care. The public option is an option that says that if you, in fact, do not have the wherewithal to be, if you qualify for Medicaid and you do not have the wherewithal in your state to get Medicaid, you automatically are enrolled, providing competition for insurance companies. That's what's going to happen. Secondly, we're going to make sure we reduce the premiums and reduce drug prices by making sure that there's competition that doesn't exist now by allowing the Medicare to negotiate drug prices with the insurance companies. Thirdly, the idea that I want to eliminate private insurance, the reason why I had such a fight for, with 20 candidates for the nomination was I support private insurance. That's why I did not one single person with private insurance would lose their insurance under my plan, nor did they under Obamacare. They did not lose their insurance unless they chose they wanted to go to something else. Lastly, we're going to make sure we're in a situation that we actually protect pre-existing. There's no way he can protect pre-existing conditions. None. Zero. You can't do it in the ether. He's been talking about this for a long time. There is no, he's never come up with a plan. I guess we're going to get the pre-existing condition plan the same time we get the infrastructure plan that we've been waiting for since 17, 18, 19, and 20. The fact, I still have a, little, a few more minutes. I know you're getting anxious. The, <laughs> the fact is that the, he's already cost the American people because of his terrible handling of the COVID virus and the economic spillover. 10 million people have lost their private insurance. And he wants to take away 22 million more people who have it under Obamacare and over 110 million people with pre-existing conditions. And all the people from COVID are going to have pre-existing conditions. What are they going to do? I have a follow-up for you, Vice President sure. Biden. It relates to something that President Trump said. He's accusing you of wanting socialized medicine. What do you say to people who have concerns that your health care plan, which includes a government insurance option, takes the country one step closer to a health care system run entirely by the government? What's I your response I say it's to ridiculous. It's like saying that, you know, we're uh, — the idea that the fact that there's a public option that people can choose — that makes it a socialist plan. Look, the difference between the president, I think health care is not a privilege, it's a right. Everyone should have the right to have affordable health care. And I am very proud of my plan. It's gotten endorsed by all the major labor unions as well as, as well as a whole range of other people who, in fact, are concerned in the medical field. This is something that's going to save people's lives, and this is going to give some people an opportunity an opportunity to have health care for their children. How many of you home are worried and rolling around in bed tonight wondering what in God's name you're going to do if you get sick because you've lost your home insurance, your, your, your health insurance, your company's gone under? We have to provide health insurance for people at an affordable rate, and that's what I do. President Trump, Excuse me, he was your there response. for 47 years. He didn't do it. <laughs> he was now there as vice president for eight years, and it's not like it was 25 years ago. It was three and three quarters. It was just a little while ago, right? Less than four years ago. He didn't do anything. He didn't do it. He wants socialized medicine, and it's not that he wants it. His vice president, I mean, she is, is more liberal then Bernie Sanders and wants it even more. Bernie Sanders wants it. The Democrats want it. You're going to have socialized medicine, just like he went with fracking. We're not going to have fracking. We're going to stop fracking. We're going to stop fracking. Then he goes to Pennsylvania after he gets a nomination, where he got very lucky to get it. And he goes to Pennsylvania, 
And he says, oh, we're going to have fracking. And you never asked that question. And by the way, so far, I respect very much the way you're handling this, I have to say. By the way. But somebody should ask the question. You can ask He, he goes for a year. There will be we no have a, fracking. We, have, there we will do be have no a number of here. we have a number of topics. We're no, no, but that's, to. a, big, we, that's and, a big question. We're going to get to we're, we're going to get to I, I, the same thing topics. with socialized medicine. I have to respond, Vice President, no. your response, please. My response is: people deserve to have affordable health care. Period. 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 And the Biden care proposal will, in fact, provide for that affordable health care, lower premiums. What we're going to do is going to cost some money. It's going to cost over $750 billion over 10 years to do it. And they're going to have lower premiums. You can buy into the better plans, the cheaper plans, lower your premiums, deal with un 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 unexpected billing, and have your drug prices drop significantly. He keeps talking about it. He hasn't done a thing for anybody on health care. Not a thing. Tristan, when Very he quickly, says, then I want to talk about what's happening public on option, Capitol Hill. He's talking about socialized medicine and, and, and health care. When he talks about a public option, he's talking about destroying your Medicare, totally Wrong. destroyed, and destroying your Social Security. And this whole country will come down. You know, Bernie Sanders tried it Bernie. in his state. He tried it in his state. His governor was a very liberal governor. They want to make it work. Okay, it, let's hear. It was let's let Vice President Biden to respond. Work. It doesn't Vice work. President he's Biden a very responds. confused guy. He thinks he's running against somebody else. He's running against Joe Biden. I beat all those other people because I disagreed with them. Joe Biden, he's running against. And the idea that we're in a situation that is going to destroy Medicare, this is the guy that the actuary at Medicare said, if in fact, at Social Security, if in fact he continues to withhold his plan to withhold the tax on Social Security, Social Security will be bankrupt in by 2023 with no way to make up for it. This is the guy who's tried to cut Medicare. So I don't I mean the idea that Donald Trump is lecturing me on Social Security and Medicare? Come on. He tried to get Ten rid seconds, of he Mr. tried President, to hurt Social to Security to years question. ago. Years ago. Go back and look at the records. He tried to hurt Social Security years ago. All One right, thing. let's move but on. This I'm is the guy move on. That Let me, they Mr. President, I have to move week, on to the next question. They say the else stock market will boom if I'm elected. If he's elected, the stock market will crash. Okay, let's move on to the next question very respond. quickly. Look, the idea that the stock market is booming is his only measure of what's happening. Where I come from in Scranton and Claymont, the people don't live off of the stock market. Just in the, uh, just in the last three, uh, three years during this crisis, so the, the billionaires in this country made, according to the Wall Street, $700 billion more dollars. $700 billion more dollars because that's his only measure. What happens to the ordinary people out there? What happens to them? Let's talk about what's happening on Capitol Hill. We're, we're going to move on, 401ks gentlemen. are through the roof. We're going to move stock on. stock are through the roof. Right. And he doesn't come from Scranton. That's like one of the, He lived there for a short period gonna, of time before okay, he even knew we're it. We're going to move on to the next left. question. And the people of Pennsylvania Let me will move show on to my that. next question, they gentlemen. Understand. As of tonight, more than 12 million people are out of work. And as of tonight, 8 million more Americans have fallen into poverty, and more families are going hungry every day. Those hit hardest are women and people of color. They see Washington fighting over a relief bill. Mr. President, why haven't you been able to get them the help they need? 30 seconds here. Because Nancy Pelosi doesn't want to approve it. I do. But you're the president. I do, but I still have to get. Unfortunately, that's one of the reasons I think we're going to take over the House because of her. Nancy Pelosi doesn't want to approve anything because she'd love to have some victories on a date called November 3rd. Nancy Pelosi does not want to approve it. We are ready, willing, and able to do something. Don't forget, we've already approved three plans, and it's gone through, including the Democrats, in all fairness. This one she doesn't want. It's near the election because she thinks it helps her politically. I think it hurts her politically. All right, Mr. Way, Vice President, you look. Know, the Republican leader in the, in, in the United States Senate said he can't pass it. He will not be able to pass it. He does not have Republican votes. Why isn't he talking to his Republican friends? Let me follow up with you, Vice President Biden. we made a Biden, deal, because the let me, let me ask Vice it. President Biden a question. You are the leader of the Democratic Party. Why have you not pushed the Democrats to get a deal for the American people? Well, I have, and they have pushed it. Look, they passed this act all the way back in the beginning of the summer. This is like it's not new. It's been out there. This HEROES Act has been sitting there. And look at what's happening. 
When I was in charge of the Recovery Act with $800 billion, I was able to get $145 billion to local communities that have to balance their budgets and states that have to balance their budgets, so they didn't have to fire fire they have to fire firefighters, teachers, first responders, law enforcement officers, so they could keep their cities and counties running. He will not support that. They have not done a thing for them. And Mitch McConnell said, let them go bankrupt. Let them go bankrupt. Come on. What's the matter the with this? The bill that guys? was passed in the House was a bailout of badly run, high crime, Democrat, all run by Democrats, cities and states. It was a way of getting a lot of money, billions and billions of dollars to these states. It was also a way of getting a lot of money from our people's pockets to people that come into our country illegally. We were going to take care of everything for them. And what that does, and I'd love to do that, I'd love to help them, but what that does, everybody all over the world will start pouring into our country. We can't do it. This was a way of taking care of them. This was a way of spending on things that had nothing to do with COVID, as per your question. But it was really a big bailout for badly run Democrat cities and states. All right, By the I way, wanna... if I get elected, I'm not going to, I'm running as a proud Democrat, but I'm going to be an American president. I don't see red states and blue states. What I see is American, United States. And folks, every single state out there finds themselves in trouble. They're going to start laying off, whether they're red or blue, cops, firefighters, first responders, because teachers, because they have to balance their budget. And the founders were smart. They allowed the federal government to deficit spend to compensate for the United States of America. I want to talk about the minimum wage, gentlemen. Mr. Yeah. Vice President, we are talking a lot about struggling small businesses yes. and business owners these days. Do you think this is the right time to ask them to raise the minimum wage? You, of course, support a $15 federal minimum wage. I do, because I think one of the things we're going to have to do is we're going to have to bail them out, too. We should be bailing them out now, those small businesses. You got one in six of them going under. They're not going to be able to make it back. They passed a, pre a, a package that allows us to be able to call PPP. Money is supposed to go to help them do everything from organize how they can deal with their businesses being open safely. D d schools, how they can make classrooms smaller, how they can hire more teachers, how they can put ventilation systems in. They need the help. The businesses as well as the schools need the help. But this, this, these guys will not help them. Is not giving them any of the money. We are going to move See, on to immigration, one, one thing very quickly, but I want to get your reaction. He said we have to help our small businesses by raising the minimum wage. That's not helping. Uh, I think right. it should be a state option. Alabama is different than New York. New York is different from Vermont. Every state is different. It should be a state you, option. You said very we recently. We have to help. It's very important. We have to help our small businesses. You, you How said, are you helping your small businesses when you're forcing wages? What's going to happen and what's been proven to happen is when you do that, these small businesses fire many of their employees. You said Not very true, recently you would consider way. raising the federal minimum Say wage it. to $15 Say an hour. It. You said recently you would consider raising the federal minimum wage to $15 I, an really hour. Like, is that still the case? And I would consider it. In a, to an extent, but in what I really like, what I re in a second administration, but not to a level that's going to put all these businesses out of business. It should be a state option. Look, Every... I've lived in different places. I know different places. They're all different. Some places, fifteen dollars is not so bad. In other places, other states, fifteen dollars. Okay, would be President ruinous. Trump. Thank no, you. Quick no response, Vice President work Biden. Two jobs, one job, be below poverty. People are making six, seven, eight bucks an hour. These first responders, we all clap for as they come down the street because they've allowed us to make it. What's happening? They deserve a minimum wage of $15. Anything below that puts you below the poverty level. And there is no evidence that when you raise the minimum wage, businesses go out of business. That is simply not true. We're going to talk no about immigration. Soul. We're going to talk about immigration now, gentlemen. And we're going to talk about families within this context. Mr. President, your administration separated children from their parents at the border, at least 4,000 kids. You've since reversed your zero tolerance policy, but the United States can't locate the parents of more than 500 children. So how will these families ever be reunited? Uh, children are brought here by coyotes and lots of bad people, cartels, and they're brought here, and they used to use them to get into our country. We now have as strong a border as we've ever had. 
We're over 400 miles of brand new wall. You see the numbers, and we let people in, but they have to come in legally, and they come in through. But Merit. how will you reunite these kids you, with their families, Mr. President? Let me just tell you, Mr. they built cages. You know, they used to say, "I built the cages," and then they had a picture in a certain newspaper, and it was a picture of these horrible cages. And they said, "Look at these cages. President Trump built them." And then it was determined they were built. In 2014, that was him. Do you they have a plan cages. to reunite the kids? Yes, with we're their working families? on it very. We're, we're trying very hard. But a lot of these kids come out without the parents. They come over through cartels and through coyotes and through gangs. Vice President Biden, let me bring you into this conversation. Quick response and then another question to you. These 500 plus kids came with parents. They separated them at the border to make it a disincentive to come to begin with. Bay, real tough. We're really strong. And guess what? They cannot — it's not coyotes didn't bring them over. Their parents were with them. They got separated from their parents. And it makes us a laughing stock and violates every notion of who we are as a nation. Let me ask you a follow-up question. Kristen, they did it. We changed the policy. Your response they to that? They did it. We, we changed. did not They built the cages. The they, who, who built the cages, let's, Joe? Let's talk about what who we're talking about. Who built the cages, about. Joe? Let's talk about what we're talking about. What happened? Parents were ripped, their kids were ripped from their arms and separated. And now they cannot find over 500 of sets of those parents, and those kids are alone. Nowhere to go. Nowhere to go. It's criminal. It's criminal. Let me ask Kristen, you about I will say this. They Ten went down. We brought reporters, everything. Them. They are so well taken care of. They're in facilities that were so clean. But some of them haven't been reunited good. with But just families. ask one question. Who built the cages? I'd love you to ask him that. Who built the cages? Let me ask about your immigration policy, Mr. Vice President. The Obama administration did fail to deliver immigration reform, which had been a key promise during the administration. It also presided over record deportations as well as family detentions at the border before changing course. So why should voters trust you with an immigration overhaul now? Because we made a mistake. It, made too, it took too long to get it right. It took too long to get it right. I'll be president of the United States, not vice president of the United States. And the fact is, I've made it very clear. Within 100 days, I'm going to send to the United States Congress a pathway to citizenship for over 11 million undocumented people. And all of those so-called dreamers, those DACA kids, they're going to be immediately certified again to be able to stay in this country and put on a path to citizenship. The idea that they are being sent home by this guy and they want to do that, is they've gone to a country they've never seen before. I can imagine you're five years old, your parents are taking you across the, the Rio Grande River and it's, and, it's, and it's illegal. And you say, oh no, mom, leave me here. I'm not going to go with you. They've been here. Many of them are model citizens. Over 20,000 of them are first responders out there taking care of people during this crisis. We owe them. We owe them. Kristen, he had reaction. eight years to do what he said he was going to do. And I've changed without having a specific. We got rid of catch and release. We got rid of a lot of horrible things that they put in and that they lived with. But he had eight years he was vice president. He did nothing except build cages to keep children in. Vice President Wrong. Biden, your response. The catch and release. You know what he's talking about there? If, in fact, you had a family came across and they were arrested. They, in fact, were given a date to show up for their hearing. They were released. And guess what? They showed up for a hearing. And this is the first president in the history of the United States of America that's anybody seeking asylum has to do it in another country. That's never happened before in America. That's never happened before in America. You come to the United States and you make your case that I seek asylum based on the following, on the following premise, why I deserve it under American law. They're sitting in squalor on the other side of the river. President Trump, your response, uh, so 30 important. seconds, and then we'll move It on. just shows that he has no understanding of immigration or the laws. Catch and release is a disaster. A murderer would come in. A rapist would come in. A very bad person would come in. We would take their name. We have to release them into our country. And then you say they come back. Less than 1 percent of the people come back. We have to send ICE out and Border Patrol out to find them. We would say, come back in two years, three years. We're going to give you a court case. You need Perry Mason. We're going to give you a court case. When you say they come back, they don't come back, Joe. They, do. they never come back. 
Only the really, I hate to say this, but those with the lowest IQ, they might come back. Okay, but President very, Trump, let's give few. Vice President Biden a chance to respond, and then we're going to move on to the you next section. You don't know section. the law, Joe. Vice President Biden, law. your response. Know the law. What he's telling you is simply not true. Well, check, check it, it out. out. They don't come back. Check it out. All right, let's move but on. But we don't have to, to worry about section. it because they terminated it, so we don't have to worry about let's it. Let's move right. on to the next and you section. Have 525 kids not knowing where in God's name they're going to be and lost their parents. Go ahead. All right, let's talk about our next section, which is race in America. And I want to talk about the way black and brown Americans experience race in this country. Part of that experience is something called the talk. It happens regardless of class and income. Parents who feel they have no choice but to prepare their children for the chance that they could be targeted, including by the police, for no reason other than the color of their skin. Mr. Vice President, in the next two minutes, I want you to speak directly to these families. Do you understand why these parents fear for their children? I do. I do. You know, my daughter is a social worker, and uh, she's, all, she's written a lot about this. She has a graduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania in social work. And, you know, uh, one of the reasons why I ended up working on the east side of Wilmington, Delaware, which is 90 percent African-American, was to learn more about what was going on. What I didn't — I never had to tell my daughter, if she's pulled over, make sure she puts — for a, a traffic stop, put both hands on top of the wheel and don't reach for the glove box, because someone may shoot you. But a black parent, no matter how wealthy or how poor they are, has to teach their child, when you're walking down the street, don't have a hoodie on when you go across the street. Making sure that you, in fact, if you get pulled over, yes, yes, sir, no, sir, hands on top of the wheel, because you are, in fact, the victim, whether you're a person making 300,000, child of a $300,000 a year person or someone who's on, on, on food stamps. The fact of the matter is, there is institutional racism in America. And we have always said, We've never lived up to it. That we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women are created equal. But guess what? We have never, ever lived up to it. But we've always constantly been moving the needle further and further to inclusion, not exclusion. This is the first president to come along and says, that's the end of that. We're not going to do that anymore. We have to provide for economic opportunity, better education, better health care, better access to schooling, better access to opportunity to borrow money to start businesses. All the things we can do, and I've laid out a clear plan as to how to do those things, just to give people a shot. It's about accumulating the ability to have wealth as well as it is to be free from violence. President Trump, same question to you, and let me remind you of the question. I would like you to speak directly to these families. Do you understand why these parents fear for their children? Yes, I do. And again, He's been in government 47 years. He never did a thing, except in 1994, when he did such harm to the black community. And they were called, and he called them, super predators. And he said that. He said it, super predators. And they kept never lived that down. 1994, your crime bill, the super predators. Nobody has done more for the black community than Donald Trump. And if you look, with the exception of Abraham Lincoln, possible exception, but the exception of Abraham Lincoln, nobody has done what I've done. Criminal justice reform, Obama and Joe didn't do it. I don't even think they tried because they had no chance at doing it. They might have wanted to do it, but if you had to see the arms I had to twist to get that done, it was not a pretty picture, and everybody knows it, including some very liberal people that cried in my office. They cried in the Oval Office. Two weeks later, they're out saying, gee, we have to defeat him. Criminal justice reform, prison reform, opportunity zones with Tim Scott, a great senator from South Carolina. He came in with this incredible idea for opportunity zones. It's one of the most successful programs. People don't talk about it. Tremendous investment is being made. Biggest beneficiary, the black and Hispanic communities, and then historically black colleges and universities. After three years of coming to the office, I love some of those guys. They were great. They came into the office, and they said, I said, what are you doing? After three years, I said, why do you keep coming back? Because we have no funding. I said, you don't have to come back every year. We have to come back. Because President Obama would never give them long-term funding, and I did. Ten-year, long-term funding, and I gave them more money than they asked for, because they said, I think you need more. 
And I said, the only bad part about this is I may never see you again, because I got very friendly with them, and they like me and I like them. But I saved it. Colleges and universities. Okay, and we're going to talk about both of your records, but your response to that, Vice President. My response to that is I never, ever said what he accused me of saying. The fact of the matter is, in 2000, though, after the crime bill had been in, 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 in the law for a while, this is a guy who said the problem with the crime bill, there's not enough people in jail. There's not enough people in jail. And go on my website, get the quote, the date when he said it. Not enough people. He talked about marauding gangs, young gangs, and the people who are going to maraud our cities. This is a guy who, in the Central Park Five, five innocent black kids, he continued to push for making sure that they got the death penalty. None of them were, none of them were guilty of what the crime, of the crimes they were suggested. Look, and talk about he, granted, he did in fact let 20 people, he commuted 20 people sentences. We commuted over 1,000 people sentences, over 1,000. The very law he's talking about is a law that, in fact, initiated by Barack Obama. And secondly, we're in a situation here where we, the federal prison system was reduced by 38,000 people under our administration. And one of these things we should be doing, there should be no, no minimum ma mandatories in the law. That's why I'm offering $20 billion to states to change their state laws to eliminate minimum mandatories and set up drug courts. No one should be going to jail because they have a drug problem. They should be going to rehabilitation, not to jail. We should fundamentally change the system, and that's what I'm going to do. But why didn't he do it four years ago? Why didn't you do that four years ago, even less than that? Why didn't you I do it? You were vice president. You keep talking about all these things you're going to do, and you're going to do this. But you were there just a short time ago, and you guys did nothing. We did. You know, Joe, I, I ran because of you. I ran because of Barack Obama, because you did a poor job. If I thought you did a good job, I would have never run. Uh, I would have never run. <laughs> I ran because of you. I'm looking at you now. You're a politician. I ran because of you. All right, Vice President Biden, your response to that, and then I do have some yeah. questions for both of you. Well, I tell you what, I, uh, I hope he does look at me, because what's happening here is you know who I am. You know who he is. You know his character. You know my character. You know our reputations for honor and telling the truth. I am anxious to have this race. I am anxious to see this take place. I am the character of the country is on the ballot. Our character is on the ballot. Look at us closely. Let me ask some follow-up. Excuse me. Please respond, if and then we're going to have follow-up If this stuff is true questions. about Russia, Ukraine, China, other countries, Iraq, if this is true, then he's a corrupt politician. All right. So don't give me the stuff about how you're this innocent baby. Joe, they're calling you a corrupt politician. Nobody's Take President the Trump, laptop I want to stay hell. on the issue Excuse of me. race. Take we're talking about the, the issue. Laptop from hell. President Trump, we're, we're talking about race right now, and I do want to stay on the issue of race. President Can Trump, you've just... I have just... to respond to that. Please. Because, look, Very there are 50 former national intelligence folks who said that what this he's accusing me of is a Russian plant. They have said that this is, has all the care. Four, five former heads of the CIA, both parties, say what he's saying is a bunch of garbage. Nobody believes it except the, his and his good friend, Rudy Gianni. You mean the laptop is now yeah. another Russia, Russia, Russia hoax? And you that's got exactly it. what. Is this that's where you're exactly going? what. This is going. where he's going. The laptop that, right. is Russia, yes. Russia, Gentlemen, Russia. I want to stay on the issue of race. You okay? have to be kidding. Here Mr. we go President, again with Russia. We're going to continue Boy, yeah, on the issue of race. Mr. President, you've described one. the Black Lives Matter movement as a symbol of hate. You've shared a video of a man chanting white power to millions of your supporters. You've said that black professional athletes exercising their First Amendment rights should be fired. What do you say to Americans who say that kind of language from a president is contributing to a climate of hate and racial strife? Well, you have to understand, the first time I ever heard of Black Lives Matter, they were chanting, pigs in a blanket, talking about police. Pigs, pigs, talking about our police. Pigs in a blanket, fry them like bacon. I said, that's a horrible thing. And they were marching down the street. And that was my first uh, glimpse of Black Lives Matter. I thought it was a terrible thing. As far as uh, my relationships with all people, I think I have great relationships with all people. I am the least racist person in this room. Well, what do you say to Americans who are concerned by that rhetoric? I don't know. The, I mean, I don't videos. know what to say. I got criminal justice reform done and prison reform and opportunity zones. I took care of black colleges and universities. I don't know what to say. 
they can say anything. I mean, they can say anything. It's a very, it makes me sad because I am, I, I am the least racist person. I can't even see the audience because it's so dark, but I don't care who's in the audience. I'm the least racist person in this room. Okay, Vice President Biden, Abraham. let me ask you very quickly and then I have a follow-up question for you. Please. Abraham Lincoln here is one of the most racist presidents we've had in modern history. He pours fuel on every single racist fire. Every single one. He started off his campaign coming down the escalator saying he's going to get rid of those Mexican rapists. He's banned Muslims because they're Muslims. He has moved around and made everything worse across the board. He says to the, about the poor boys, last time we were on stage here, he said, I told him to stand down and stand ready. Come on. This guy has a dog whistle about as big as a foghorn. President Trump, I'm going to give you 10 seconds to respond, and then I have a follow-up. You know, he made a reference to Abraham Lincoln. Where did that come in? I mean, you said you're Abraham that, Lincoln. No, no, where did that? No, no. You said I said not since Abraham Lincoln has anybody right. done what I've done for the black community. And I'm saying I didn't say I'm Abraham Lincoln. I said not since Abraham Lincoln has anybody Please. done what I've done for the black community. Now you have done nothing other than the crime bill, which put. Oh, God. Th tens of thousands of black men, mostly, in jail. All Not right. Let me, you know let what? Me, let me they ask remember Vice it President because Biden if you look at what's happening with the voting right now, let me ask they Vice remember President that Biden you treated them very, very badly. The, Just the, take a look at what's happening out there. Vice President Biden, let me give you a chance to respond within this context. Crime okay. bills that you supported in the 80s and 90s contributed to the incarceration of tens of thousands of young black men who had small amounts of drugs in their possession. They are sons, they are brothers, they're fathers, they're uncles, whose families are still to this day, some of them suffering the consequences. So speak to those families. Why should they vote for you? One of the things is that in the 80s, we passed 100 percent, all 100 senators voted for it, a bill on drugs and how to deal with drugs. It was a mistake. I've been trying to change the sense, and particularly the portion on cocaine. That's why I've been arguing that, in fact, we should not send anyone to jail for a pure drug offense. They should be going into treatment across the board. That's what we should be spending money on. That's why I set up drug courts, which were never funded by our Republican friends. They should not be going to jail for a drug or an alcohol problem. They should be going into treatment, treatment. That's what we've been trying to do. That's what I'm going to get done, because I think may, the American people have now seen that, in fact, it was a mistake to pass those laws relating to the drug. But they were not in the crime bill. But okay, why sorry. didn't he get it done? See, it's all talk, no action with these politicians. Why didn't he get it done? That's sorry. what I'm going to do when I become president. You were vice president, along with Obama as your president, your leader, for eight years. Why didn't you get it done? You had eight years to get it done. Now you're saying you're going to get it done because you're all talk and no action, Jim. We got your a lot response. of it done. We released 38,000. We got 38,000 prisoners left from the You got out, nothing done. 38,000 prisoners were released from federal prison. We have, there were over 1,000 people who were given clemency. We have made, in fact, we're the ones that put in the legislation saying we could look at pattern and practice of police departments and what they were doing, how they were conducting themselves. I could go on, but we began the process. We began the process. We lost an election. That's why I'm running to win back that election and change his terrible policy. I just asked, and then we're I just move asked on one question. Why didn't you do it in the eight years, a short time ago? Why didn't you do it? You just said, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. You put tens because of thousands of mostly black young men in prison. Now you're saying you're going to get, you're going to undo that. Why didn't you get it done? You had eight years with Obama. Because you know why, Joe? Because you're all talk and no action. All right, Vice President because Biden, and then we're going to move on to the next section. We had a Republican Congress. That's the answer. Well, you okay. Gotta talk, you got to talk them into it, Joe. Sometimes All right. You got to talk them into it. We're going to move on to our next you know, section. Like I which did with criminal justice change. reform. Okay. I had to talk Democrats into Gentlemen, it. Gentlemen, you we're, did. We're, what we we're running out of done. time, so we got to get on to okay. climate change, please. You both have very different visions on climate change. President Trump, you say that environmental regulations have hurt jobs in the energy sector. Vice President Biden, you have said you see addressing climate change as an opportunity to create new jobs. For each of you, how would you both combat climate change and support job growth at the same time, starting with you, President Trump? You have two minutes uninterrupted. 
So uh, we have the Trillion Trees program. We have so many different programs. I do love the environment, but what I want is the cleanest crystal clear water, the cleanest air. We have the best, lowest number in carbon emissions, which is a big standard that I notice Obama goes with all the time. Not Joe. I haven't heard Joe use the term because I'm not sure he knows what it represents or means, but I have heard Obama use it. And we have the best carbon emission numbers that we've had in 35 years under this administration. We are working so well with industry, but here's what we can't do. Look at China, how filthy it is. Look at Russia. Look at India. It's filthy. The, the air is filthy. The Paris Accord, I took us out because we were going to have to spend trillions of dollars, and we were treated very unfairly. When they put us in there, they did us a great disservice. They were going to take away our businesses. I will not sacrifice tens of millions of jobs, thousands and thousands of companies because of the Paris Accord. It was so unfair. China doesn't kick in until 2030. Russia goes back to a low standard, and we kicked in right away. It would have been, it would have been, it would have destroyed our businesses. So, you ready? We have done an incredible job environmentally. We have the cleanest air, the cleanest water, and the best carbon emission standards that we've seen in many, many years. Vice President and we Biden. haven't destroyed our industries. Vice President Biden, two minutes to you, uninterrupted. Climate change and climate warming, the global warming, is an existential threat to humanity. We have a moral obligation to deal with it. And we're told by all the leading scientists in the world, we don't have much time. We're going to pass the point of no return within the next eight to ten years. Four more years of this man eliminating all the regulations that were put in by us to clean up the climate, to clean up, to limit the, the uh, limited emissions will put us in a position where we're going to be in real trouble. Here's where we have a great opportunity. I was able to get both all the environmental organizations as well as labor, the people worried about jobs, to support my climate plan. Because what it does, it will create millions of new good-paying jobs. We're going to invest in, for example, 500,000 50,000, excuse me, 50,000 charging stations on our highways so that we can own the electric car market of the future. In the meantime, China is doing that. We're going to be in a position where we're going to see to it that we're going to take 4 million existing billion buildings and 2 million existing homes and retrofit them so they don't leak as much energy, saving hundreds of millions of barrels of oil in the process and creating significant number of jobs. And by the way, the whole idea of what this is all going to do, it's going to create millions of jobs, and it's going to clean the environment. Our health and our jobs are at stake. That's what's happening. And what right now, by the way, Wall Street firms indicated that my plan, my, my plan will, in fact, create 18.6 million jobs, 7 million more than his. This is from Wall Street. And I'll create $1 trillion more in economic growth than his proposal does. Not on climate, just on the economy. Well, President uh, Trump, you're right. They came out and said very strongly, $6,500 will be taken away from families under his plan, that his plan is an economic disaster. If you look at what he wants to do, you know, the — if you look at his plan, no, his environmental plan, you know who developed it? AOC plus three. They know nothing about the climate. I mean, she's got a good line of stuff, but she knows nothing about the climate. And they're all hopping through hoops for AOC plus three. Look, their real plan costs $100 trillion. If we had the best year in the history of our country for 100 years, we would not even come close to a number like that. When he says buildings, they want to take buildings down because they want to make bigger windows into smaller windows. As far as they're concerned, if you had no window, it would be a lovely thing. This is the craziest plan that anybody has ever seen. And this wasn't done by smart people. This wasn't done by anybody. Frankly, I don't even know how it could be good politically. Right. They want to spend $100 trillion. That's their real number. He's trying to say it was six. It's $100 <laughs> trillion. They want to knock down buildings and build new buildings with little, tiny, small windows. I mean, and many other things. Okay. And many other things. Let me have the vice president respond, and we're crazy. running out of time, and we have a lot and more you'll questions destroy to get our to. Country. So let's hear from the vice president. I have a number more questions. I don't know where he comes from. 
don't know where he comes up with these numbers. We a hundred trillion dollars. Give me a break. This plan was this is plan is endorsed by every major, every major environmental group and every labor group. Labor, because they know the future lies. The future lies in us being able to breathe, and they know their good jobs and getting us there. And by the way, the fastest growing industry in America are is 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 the electric the, uh, excuse me, uh, solar energy and wind. He thinks wind causes cancer, windmills. It's the fastest growing jobs, and they pay good prevailing wages, 45, 50 bucks an hour. We can grow and we can be cleaner if we go the route I'm proposing. President Trump, excuse me. please we respond, energy, and then I have to follow We are follow energy up. independent for the first time. We don't need all of these countries that we had to fight war over because we needed their energy. We are energy independent. I know more about wind than you do. Oh. It's extremely expensive, kills all the birds, it's very intermittent, it's got a lot of problems, and they happen to make the windmills in both Germany and China. And the fumes coming up, if you're a believer in carbon emission, the fumes coming up to make, make these massive windmills is more than anything that we're talking about with natural gas, which is very clean. One other thing. Find me a scientist solar. Who said that. I love solar, but solar doesn't quite have it yet. It's not powerful yet to, to really run our big, beautiful factories that we need to compete with the world. So False. it's all a pipe dream. But you know what we'll do? We're going to have the greatest economy in the world. But if you want to kill the All economy, right. get rid of your oil industry. You want and, — and what about fracking? All right. Now, let me, now let we me have, have to ask Let me allow fracking. Vice President I Biden to respond. I never said I oppose fracking. Y you said it I, on tape. I did. Show the tape. Put it on your website. I'll put it on. Put it on the website. The fact of the matter is Show he's flat lying. Would you flat. rule out banning fracking? I do rule out banning fracking because the answer we need we need other industries to transition to get to ultimately a complete zero emissions by 2025. What I will do with fracking over time is make sure that we can capture the emissions from the fracking, capture the emissions from gas. We can do that, and we can do that by investing money in doing it. But it's a transition to that. I have one more question Excuse in this pot, and then we Excuse me. We have he was against fracking. He said it. I will show that to you tomorrow. I Good. am against fracking. Until he got the nomination, went to Pennsylvania, then he said, but you know what, Pennsylvania? He'll be against it very soon, because his party is totally against fracking it. Fracking on federal land, I said. No fracking you and said or fracking. oil on federal land. Let me ask this final question in this section, and then I want to move on to our final section. President Trump, people of color are much more likely to live near oil refineries and chemical plants. In Texas, there are families who worry the plants near them are making them sick. Your administration has rolled back regulations on these kinds of facilities. Why should these families give you another four years in office? Uh, the families that we're talking about are employed heavily, and they are making a lot of money, more money than they've ever made. If you look at the kind of numbers that we produce for Hispanic, for Black, for Asian, it's nine times greater the percentage gain than it was under in three years than it was under eight years of the two of them, to put it nicely. Nine times more. Now, somebody lives, I have not heard the numbers or the statistics that you're saying, but they're making a tremendous amount of money economically. We saved it. And I saved it again a number of months ago when oil was crashing because of the pandemic. Okay. We saved it. We got, say what you want about relationship, we got Saudi Arabia, Mexico, and Russia to cut back way back. We saved our oil industry, and now it's very vibrant again. Right. And everybody has very inexpensive gasoline. Remember Vice that. President Biden, your response, and then we're going to have a final question for both of you. My response is that those people live on what they call fence lines. He doesn't understand this. They live near chemical plants that, in fact, pollute chemical plants and oil plants and refineries that pollute. I used to live near that when I was growing up in Claymont, Delaware. And all the more oil refineries in Marcus Hook and the Delaware River than there is any place, including in Houston at the time. When my mom get in the car and when, when there were first frost to drive me to school, turn in the windshield wiper, there'd be oil slick in the window. That's why so many people in my state were dying and getting cancer. The fact is, those frontline communities, it doesn't matter what you're paying them, it matters how you keep them safe. What do you do? And you impose restrictions on the pollutions that it, the pollutants coming out of those fence line communities. 
Okay, I have one final would question. Would he close it down falls, the oil industry? It falls. Would you close down the oil industry? By the way, I would transition from the oil industry, yes. Oh, I will that's transition. a big statement. Thank it you. is a big statement. That's a because big statement. I would stop. Why would you do that? Because the oil industry pollutes significantly. Oh, I see. And here's the deal. But that's you can't a big do statement. That. Well, if you let me finish the statement, because it has to be replaced by renewable energy over time, over time. And I'd stop giving to the oil industry, I'd stop giving them federal subsidies. He won't give federal subsidies to the to the gas, excuse me, to the to uh, solar and wind. Yeah. Why are we giving it to oil industry? We actually do All give right. it to solar and wind. We and that's maybe the biggest question. statement in terms of business. That's the biggest statement. Okay. Because basically what he's saying question, is he is Mr. going President. to destroy the oil industry. Okay. Will you remember that, Texas? Will you okay. remember that, Pennsylvania, Oklahoma? Vice President Biden, let me give you 10 seconds to respond, Ohio. and then I have to get to the final question. Vice President Biden. He takes everything out of context, but the point is, look, we have to move toward a net zero emissions. The first place to do that by the year 2035 is in energy okay. production by 2050 totally. All right. One is final question. Is he going to get China to do it? No, we're finished with is this. Is he going we have to, to get China to, to do it? Our final question. No, we have to I'm move on to our final question. I'm going to rejoin Paris Accord and make oh. China abide by what they agreed to. All right. This is about leadership, dollars. gentlemen. And this first question does go to you, President Trump. Imagine this is your inauguration day. What will you say in your address to, America, to Americans who did not vote for you? You'll each have one minute, starting with you, Mr. We President. have to make a country totally successful, as it was prior to the plague coming in from China. Now we're rebuilding it, and we're doing record numbers, 11.4 million jobs in a short period of time, et cetera. But I will tell you, go back. Before the plague came in, just before, I was getting calls from people that were not normally people that would call me. They wanted to get together. We had the best black unemployment numbers in the history of our country, Hispanic, women, Asian, People with diplomas, with no diplomas, MIT graduates, number one in the class, everybody had the best numbers. And you know what? The other side wanted to get together. They wanted to unify. Success is going to bring us together. We are on the road to success. But I'm cutting taxes, and he wants to raise everybody's taxes, and he wants to put new regulations on everything. He will kill it. If he gets in, you will have a depression, the likes of which you've never seen. Your 401ks will go to hell, and it'll be a very, very sad day for this country. All right. Vice President Biden, same question to you. What will you say during your inaugural address to Americans who did not vote for you? I will say I'm an American president. I represent all of you, whether you voted for me or against me. And I'm going to make sure that you're represented. I'm going to give you hope. We're going to move. We're going to choose science over fiction. We're going to choose hope over fear. We're going to choose to move forward because we have enormous opportunities, enormous opportunities to make things better. We can grow this economy. We can deal with the systemic racism. And at the same time, we can make sure that our economy is being run and moved and motivated by clean energy, creating millions of new jobs. And that's the fact. That's what we're going to do. And I'm going to say, as I said at the beginning, what is on the ballot here is the character of this country. Decency, honor, respect, treating people with dignity, making sure that everyone has an even chance. And I'm going to make sure you get that. You haven't been getting it the last four years. All right. I want to thank you both for a very robust hour and a half, a fantastic debate. Really appreciate it. President Trump, former Vice President Joe Biden, thank you to Belmont University for hosting us tonight. And most importantly, thank you to those watching tonight. Election Day is November 3rd. Don't forget to vote. Thank you, everyone, and have a great night. Thank you. Sharp contrast tonight as President Donald Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden shared the stage for the final time. The coronavirus, immigration, foreign policy, race relations, environmental justice. Kristen Welker, the moderator, hit on a lot of topics tonight in these 90 minutes, and it was a night for the history books where voters get to write the ending. I'm Libby Casey, and you are watching a special report from The Washington Post. You can see the candidates' spouses joining them there on stage. A reminder, as you just heard Kristen Welker talk about, the election is just 12 days away. Well, with me tonight for a recap, Rhonda Colvin, Capitol Hill reporter, national political reporters, James Homan and Dave Weigel. 
Welcome to you all. Rhonda, let's start with you as we watch the candidates here exit the stage for your key takeaways of tonight's final debate. Well, the key takeaway is this was far different from what we saw last time in Cleveland. And in fact, I believe the bar may have been so low that really nothing could have gone over what we saw then. That was unwatchable. This at least had a little bit more substance. It covered a lot of ground in terms in terms of a variation of topics. I think the, the two standout topics were, for me were the uh, the immigration segment and also the race in America segment. Their records were compared and, and there was actually a debate on those records. So I think uh, it's, it's extremely hard to declare a winner or a loser in these things because they're both very, very different from each other and they're both speaking to two very different Americas. But uh, in terms of comparing it to last time, it at least was watchable and we did, um, we heard from both of them. We could hear both of them. Mm. Uh, James Hellman, let's go to you for your takeaways. Also, there is a danger in sort of setting the bar so low for President Trump in particular because of his decision at the last debate to interrupt constantly, to kind of change the topic. And so, you know, we were sort of warned, you know, don't set the bar so low that a civil debate equals, you know, a great night uh, for President Trump or uh, uh, an ability by Joe Biden to just like get a cogent thought together because he wasn't being interrupted. So I'd like to hear from you about your thoughts of how tonight went. I think Biden's prep showed Libby. I do think cogent is the right word to describe his performance, especially in the first hour. Trump needed something to dramatically change the trajectory of the race. And the way he tried to do that, uh, which perhaps wasn't terribly surprising, was to rechannel what worked for him in 2016, which is to run against Biden as if Biden was the incumbent. Trump acted as if he was the underdog repeatedly. Uh, he you know, attacked Biden for outraising him for taking getting more money from Wall Street than him uh, when he was pushed on child separation. He blamed the Obama administration for building the cages that he put the kids who he separated from their parents into. Uh, you know, when he was pressed on Russia, Trump attacked the Obama Biden administration uh, for letting Russia annex Crimea. Uh, and it, it really was reminiscent in a lot of ways of the final debate of the 2016 campaign. And it, it reflects, I think, a Trump desire to do what he knows worked for him before. And so th the president was certainly more subdued again in the first hour. He sort of, you know, I, I think got pepped up a little bit in that last half hour. But I didn't see anything tonight. I thought both sides put their best foot forward. Ultimately, you know, we have the worst public health crisis since 1918, the worst economy since 1933, and the worst racial strife since 1968. That's a very bad recipe for an incumbent. And Trump couldn't change those facts tonight. So I'm not sure this, this meaningfully changes the race. Dave Weigel, let's bring you into the conversation. Uh, let's get your reflections. Well, uh the mute button I expected going in would be more helpful for the president who cannot resist talking over, interrupting, scoring a point. Uh, and I think it helped Biden, who is not as adroit as some Democratic nominees in answering in answering a question, landing it completely. Uh, one thing that the Trump people wanted was just to, because they really are bought in on the let's make Biden seem feeble, everybody thing is, yeah, there's there's moments where he was he was searching for a word. He didn't ever lose one. I mean, the closest he came, I think, was calling the Proud Boys poor boys at one point. Um, but that's the theater, the theater criticism stuff. In substance, I thought it was fascinating that the, the president absolutely abandoned the law and order stuff that he had focused on for much of the campaign uh, for really months. Well, the exchange on criminal justice reform on race, it was entirely about what he'd done for black America. No, uh, no Antifa, none of the stuff he'd used. And I, I thought in terms of uh, finding a, a way to hit Biden that was that was effective because uh, Biden prepped. Uh, Biden uh, has prepped many times and answered many times defund the police questions. Uh, having him out there for a few minutes defending the criminal justice record of the Obama administration, he just had to matter of fact factly say Republicans blocked some what they wanted to do. Uh, and but in terms of what Biden was able to deliver, I thought I, I thought after the VP debate, a mo moment that didn't get enough attention because it wasn't that flashy was uh, Kamala Harris talking about decriminalizing marijuana. I thought in our one tonight of, of Biden saying clearly that he wants a $15 minimum wage is again, the sort of message that Democrats have in their polling books and they know that it's popular and they rarely get a chance to say it. Uh, so in, in, bo in both of those ways, I think Trump had some effective moments and Biden did too. Well, a considerable portion of tonight's debate focused on the coronavirus and it was the first topic brought up. It was a chance for voters to see the stark differences between the plans of Trump and Biden. 
Let's go to Joyce Coe outside the debate hall in Nashville with more. Joyce. Well, Libby, I think the mute function tonight really did its purpose and uh, allowed for some clarity on issues like the coronavirus with both candidates giving each other uh, a time to speak and not really interrupting one another. We heard uh, from President Trump talking about the coronavirus uh, in terms of the death toll. He brings up this number a lot, the estimated 2.2 million, and essentially making the point that not that many people have died. He also talked about the coronavirus in terms of certain spikes in states, states like Arizona, uh, that he said, quote, uh, the spikes are now gone. This is in contrast to what we heard from Biden tonight. He came prepared with a number of one-liners, specifically on the coronavirus and specifically to refute uh, President Trump's approach to handling the virus. Here's a moment from tonight's debate when President Trump told voters that Biden wanted to shut down the country. Biden fired back and said, I don't want uh, he, sorry, he said, I'm not going to shut down the virus. I want to shut down. Sorry, he said, I'm going to shut down the virus, not the country. Take a listen. You can't do this. We can't keep this country closed. This is a massive country with a massive economy. People are losing their jobs. They're committing suicide. There's depression, alcohol, drugs at a level that nobody's ever seen before. There's abuse, tremendous abuse. We have to open our country. You know, I've said it often, the cure cannot be worse than the problem itself. Vice and that's what's happening. And he wants to close down, he'll close down the country. It's simply not true. We ought to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. We ought to be able to safely open, but would they need resources to open? You need to be able to, for example, if you're going to open a business, have social distancing within the business. You need to have, if you have a restaurant, you need to have plexiglass dividers so people cannot infect one another. You need to be in a position where you can take testing rapidly and know whether a person is, in fact, infected. You need to be able to trace. You need to be able to provide the, all the resources that are needed to do this. And that is not inconsistent with saying that what we're going to make sure that we open safely. Now, the debate over the coronavirus was particularly interesting because there was a moment where we were able to contrast not just how President Trump has handled the virus to how Biden would handle the virus if he were president, but we were also able to see how different both candidates feel on the virus going forward. We heard from President Trump his response being exactly what we've heard for the last eight months, saying, quote, it will go away, we are rounding the corner, it will go away end quote, and the virus going away is something that we have heard from President Trump uh, since March in April, well into the virus this summer. Biden's response grappled with the reality of the numbers. He uh, mentioned that 220,000 uh, deaths have occurred in the United States as it relates to the coronavirus. He mentioned 70,000 new cases a day. And right now, as far as new cases are concerned, uh, we are nearly as high uh, in new cases, in daily new cases, as we were at the height of the pandemic, uh, as far as new cases are concerned, back in mid-July. So Biden uh, mentioning the reality and also giving his plan to, uh, number one, invest in rapid tests. He also said he wants to give businesses financial resources to open up safely and also have national standards for opening the country back up uh, as it relates to education and schools. President Trump did mention that uh, the vaccine is on the way. He promised a vaccine by the end of the year, which is what we've heard from his administration. But we really didn't hear uh, much more than that as far as the plan is concerned from President Trump. Libby. Thanks so much, Joyce Co. live for us in Nashville. Thank you, Joyce. Well, let's listen to moderator Kristen Welker trying to pin down President Trump on his plan and the timeline to beat the coronavirus. You have said a vaccine is coming soon within weeks now. Your own officials say it could take well into 2021 at the earliest for enough Americans to get vaccinated. And even then, they say the country will be wearing masks and distancing into 2022. Is your timeline realistic? No, I think my timeline is going to be more accurate. I don't know that they're counting on the military the way I do, but we have our generals lined up, one in particular that's the head of logistics. And this is a very easy distribution for him. He's ready to go as soon as we have the vaccine. And we expect to have 100 million vials. As soon as we have the vaccine, he's ready to go. Let's go to James Homan for more on what President Trump is promising right now. So, James, the, you know, you could just see the reporters, okay, writing down the names of the companies that President Trump was saying are close to getting those vaccines because there's some fact-checking, obviously, that needs to be done on that. 
Yeah, it was part of a pattern, Libby, of the president sort of offering a delusional picture of reality, uh, not just on the coronavirus, but, you know, it's, he said, I think we're going to win the House. I would bet on it. Uh, and everyone, including every House Republican, thinks that they're going to lose seats in the House. Uh, and, and some of that is the power of positive thinking. That's the president's favorite book, Norman Vincent Peale. And I think that the president does believe that if you just kind of project confidence, good things will happen. And he is in many ways, I guess, the opposite of the boy who cried wolf, uh, which, which Joyce just mentioned and which Biden leaned into, which is, yes, the president says a vaccine will be approved soon. Uh, just like he said we were going to be able to go to church on Easter, just like he said for years that he's going to put out a detailed health care plan in two weeks. And because he squandered that credibility, I think a lot of people don't buy it. On the other hand, you know, they, it, it can't hurt for an incumbent to project positivity that way. Uh, to the names of the individual vaccine makers, uh, you know, the, there's a, a big meeting taking place uh, today and tomorrow where the scientists, the kind of the government experts are actually reviewing the data that we've gotten so far, uh, you know, and, and the, they really have resisted political pressure thus far uh, to great consternation from the president. Uh, and I, and I, the president's not going to be able to speed up that timeline. They're going to, to make sure that this is safe and effective before they put it out there for millions of people to use. And even when they do approve it, uh, as, as Kristen Wilker noted, it's going to take quite a long time, uh, a year, a year and a half, until kind of we're at some semblance of, of a new normal. And it, at one point, Trump sort of acknowledged that. Uh, in, he kind of granted that in, in his answer to one of the follow-up questions. Mm. Rhonda Colvin, let's go to you. You know, we've already talked a little bit about how uh, Joe Biden clearly prepared for this. He had some one-liners that he was able to sort of zing out at times. And one of those came as the, the conversation turned to why President Trump didn't sound the alarm earlier for Americans about the severity and dangers of the coronavirus. And, and uh, Joe Biden, turned this idea of people panicking, not wanting to make people panic, and talked about sort of the American strength at that moment and, and saying that Americans don't panic, that President Trump panicked. Can you reflect on that? Yeah, that, that was a very effective tool for Biden to come back with that, that reporting from Bob Woodward, who um, published the, the tapes where Trump said that uh, the virus was going to be dangerous, it was airborne, but yet he did not want to panic everyone, and that is why he was not forthcoming with what he knew and the level of danger the, the coronavirus was. So that is something that is so memorable for all Americans. So for Joe Biden to bring that up quickly, again, points the finger back at Donald Trump that this virus got out of control. It was a very quick way to reference back that this administration failed the American people when it came to figuring out a way that across the nation would have addressed the, uh, the issue when it first started. So that's something that if people at home don't understand the ins and outs of the policy that was discussed or foreign affairs that were discussed, everybody can understand when the president withheld information for reasons he says were to not panic anyone. Mm. Dave Weigel, you know, there are moments where President Trump was trying to paint Joe Biden uh, in, in one light, but then kind of doing a total 180 and showing the opposite side of that coin. For example, saying that he was taking money from Wall Street, cozying up to Wall Street, but, but on the other hand, a little while later, Dave, talking about how, you know, the, the stock market would, would essentially tank if, uh, if, if there's a President Biden. We see the same thing on the question of racial justice and the crime bill. So talk about this, this President Trump wanting to have it both ways and how well some of those arguments stick. Well, we don't know how well they stick. Uh, the president, I think, never get, has gotten over his habit of, of bringing things back to shorthand Fox News stuff. I mean, this is somebody who translates in real time what he's seeing on Fox and Friends uh, to tweets and sometimes policy. So he referred to some stuff, I think, that just is going to go over people's heads. And I noticed some Republican strategists will say, look at what people are Googling um, to prove that this is going to work. When most cases, let's say you Google Biden and fracking right now, uh, you're going to find the fact checks about how Biden's not for getting rid of all fracking. He just wants to get rid of the federal, the new fracking on federal lands, et cetera. Uh, so I, I, I think you're, you're right, though, that the, the presentation he gave was something he does at the rallies, which is... Uh, focus on things that I did in the first three years of my presidency and things theoretically I could do but won't explain in, in my second term. Uh, that's what he wants to deliver. And that's that's the trouble in, in scoring this beyond seeing what positions everybody staked out. 
is is both of them are much more effective at just delivering what they have honed in their speeches, in their prep, and in their in their advertising. Even I saw some Republicans saying they they can exploit uh, Biden talking about transitioning away from from the oil industry. That is something he's talked about. That's if you watch an ad right now for BP or Chevron, that's all they talk about is energy company, but not necessarily oil company. So uh, I didn't see either person make make the kind of um, error that they would they would want back. Um, let's go to James for more on on that question of transitioning away from oil. Um, uh, surrogates for President Trump are saying that this is a big headline from the night for them. So uh, and President Trump, even in the moment, said this is you know this is a, this is a big deal here. So let's talk about what Joe Biden said and how uh, this is so relevant to voters in crucial states. It's it's huge in Western Pennsylvania, which is where Trump ran up his margins in 2016, vastly exceeding you know what the numbers Mitt Romney got in 2012. And uh, two new polls in the last two days show Texas neck and neck. This certainly, uh, even just kind of hinting and, and using fear mongering tactics could uh, really help the president, you know, with, with kind of people who work in the energy industry in the Houston suburbs who may be uncomfortable with Trump. But the language itself is actually pretty consistent, uh, entirely consistent, actually, with what Biden was saying in his stump speech during the Democratic primaries. And I think it does speak to the broader reality tonight, which is that Trump didn't necessarily make a compelling case or offer a rationale for why he should get a second term. Instead, he focused on warning people why they should not vote for Biden, why Biden is scary, why they should be afraid of him. And that fits with what I was saying a couple minutes ago about Trump acting sort of like the underdog, Trump in some ways trying to pretend like Biden is almost the incumbent uh, president, which worked against Hillary Clinton. And I think that that was really encapsulated during that last exchange on energy and fracking and uh, and and you know, Trump saying, I know more about wind than you do and all of that. Well, stay with us. More analysis from the newsroom of The Washington Post in just a moment. As business moves forward, we're changing the way things get done, like how we redefine collaboration and keep our customers happy. You can rely on AT&T to help keep your business connected. This is a special report from the Washington Post on debate night in America. I'm Libby Casey with you from our newsroom, and I'm joined by Rhonda Colvin, James Homan, and Dave Weigel. Rhonda, there were moments where Joe Biden expressed regret or talked about mistakes that were made during the course of his, uh, his elected life. He talked about uh, immigration. He talked about the crime bill. Um, let's talk both about his use of words and how he framed those past policies and then also what it means to do some course correcting. Yeah, that was pretty significant when he talked about the uh, Obama-Biden uh, immigration reforms and he talked about going back to the table when he's president. So that sort of distanced himself from the administration that he was formerly a part of. And then when it comes to the crime bill, he uh, did talk about uh, mistakes made there, he feels. But uh, that's, that's always an interesting debate about the crime bill and his involvement in it. I know last year a lot of people thought that that would be the, the one Achilles heel for him if he became the nominee, his vote for that and how it possibly could have fed mass incarceration in the nation. But historians, when you look at it, and I've done research on this for a, a story that I did last year, uh, a lot of historians aren't quite sure if it's singularly uh, contributed to mass incarceration, but he still is trying to distance himself from his role in that bill. In fact, I, I spoke with uh, Majority Whip in the House, uh, James Clyburn, who uh, last year for the story, he told me that he still supported his own vote for the crime bill. So there's a lot of uh, mixed history and mixed feelings about that uh, crime bill. But of course, uh, Joe Biden, he was prepared for that question. He, has, he got it a lot when he was a primary candidate. He uh, got it again uh, when in the Cleveland debate. So it's something that he's very prepared to talk about and kind of distance himself from that vote. Dave Weigel, uh, President Trump was asked by Kristen Welker um, about you know the talk, about the talk that black Americans have to have with their children uh, when they think about getting pulled over by the police, when they talk about how they can stay safe as Americans. You know, let's talk about how President Trump used his time tonight and whether he was trying to make connections with the American people, making those direct appeals, um, or if he focused on something else. 
Uh, well, yeah, I think you've pinpointed something very different about their styles. Uh, the president has, I think, spent more time in front of TV cameras than anyone has ever run for president before. And he does approach debates. He approached this one as as a debate, as an argument, as as a as a t chance to be an alpha and win a point. Uh, he did so when he broke the fourth wall. It was to attack Joe Biden. And when when Joe Biden broke the fourth wall and talked to the audience, as he did in the first debate, it was to talk about how people shouldn't be so focused on them as candidates and they should focus on their lives, their problems, uh, what they need. Uh, so they. It, it was fascinating to watch the president, I, I think, borrow a little bit of what worked for Biden, but reverse engineer it in a different in a different way. Uh, and I, it was one of those moments, and this is, this is always tough to score because this is a president who's, whose base is only about 40 percent of the country, but is pretty immovable. That's one of those things where I'm sure that was that was a killer for, for, him, for him. But look, the Biden campaign has also been at this for a while. He's been at this for a while. The, the schmaltzy appeal to the person back home and saying that the, the debate has gotten off, uh, enough, if not off the rails, gotten off the real issue, that people do that because it's, it's successful. I mean, you can sound like a phony. So that was what, what, what the president was trying to do by <laughs> making the subtext into text. Uh, but Biden was telling more detailed stories, for example, about growing up around pollution, about uh, why he was so passionate about racial equality. And the president do that when the president told a story, it was typically somebody came to the office and he wouldn't mention the name of the somebody and talk about a conversation they had with him. Um, that's what he should do in some ways. He's the president. He can talk about what the experience of being president is, but different tactics and uh, Biden's has been more effective in the past. Mm. But Rhonda Colvin, Kristen Welker, the moderator, really invited these candidates to hit a personal note, you know, in, in talking about families and the talk, in inviting them at the end of the night to make their close, you know, to, to say, in fact, it wasn't a closing argument, it was instead to say, what would you do on your inauguration? What would be your message to those Americans who didn't vote for you? And there were other times when she made it personal, talking about children separated from their parents at the border. So uh, what was your interpretation of how the candidates chose to deal with those opportunities? Yeah, she, she did sort of set the tone right off the bat with a uh, sort of uh, warmth when she uh, started her line of questioning uh, to both men. So I think you're right that she did try to make this uh, a, an event where both men could come with their own personal experiences on all of these issues. It's important to note when uh, they, when she asked Trump the question about the talk and asked, do you empathize with families who have to have this talk? He just quickly said, uh, yes, but Joe Biden uh, is responsible for the 94 crime bill, which locked up uh, many black men and they'll remember it when they go to the polls. That's what Trump said. So even though she was trying to get, gave them a lot of space to come with their own uh, feelings on some kitchen table and personal issues, uh, sometimes Trump just pivoted to uh, what attacks to Biden. Yeah, well, immigration came up tonight uh, and uh, it came up in the context of a very controversial chapter of the Trump administration, one that has come under so much criticism, the policy of separating children from their families as they cross the border. Let's watch. Parents were ripped, their kids were ripped from their arms and separated. And now they cannot find over 500 of sets of those parents and those kids are alone. Nowhere to go, nowhere to go. It's criminal. It's criminal. Let me ask Kristen, you about Kristen, I will say this. They went down. We brought reporters, everything. They are so well taken care of. They're in facilities that were so clean. But some of them haven't been reunited good. with But just families. ask one question. Who built the cages? I'd love you to ask of that. Who built the cages? Let me ask. That's earlier tonight. James Homan, let's go to you uh, to, to, to give some clarity on this. So this is a, a low point of the Trump presidency. They did it in secret for a year as part of a pilot program. Then they announced that they were separating children from their parents in what was intended to be a deterrent uh, to people crossing the border illegally. Uh, it was a, a kind of a, a poorly designed and implemented effort. There was broad public blowback, including from Republicans. So they ditched it. Interestingly, the president did not make an effort to substantively defend this policy, uh, which he did champion, uh, and and instead <laughs> tried to to pivot and blame Biden again, acting like he was the challenger and Biden was the incumbent. Uh, Biden distanced himself a little bit from the Obama administration policy, which was a vulnerability for him in the primary. Julian Castro attacked Biden pretty hard uh, for child separation, uh, kind of the the, the 
the some of the underlying policies existed in the Obama administration, although it wasn't anything like what Trump did. And and uh, this is one of those things that is important for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it, it has really hurt Trump in the suburbs. Uh, you know, we this is kind of it, it has made the president look callous and heartless, also incompetent. Uh, the the his numbers have been very steady, as Dave was noting a minute ago, but they did take a hit uh, in, a, in a significant way during the family separation crisis. The second thing is the Latino vote, uh, which is pivotal in Arizona and Nevada. Uh, Florida, it's a, a different dynamic. It's not as top of mind an issue, uh, but it comes up in Texas. And one of Biden's real struggles has been that he is not galvanizing Latino voters the way that Hillary Clinton did. He's underperforming in some ways. Uh, Trump has, has made inroads with some parts of that community. And so this th this this conversation came up in the debate tonight because there was a report that a federal judge put out uh, that that said, you know, earlier this week, the, the f more than 500 kids still don't know where their parents are. The government can't find them. They were deported after they were taken away from their parents. And um, so now the kids are here and the parents are back in Central and South America. Uh, and, and raising the saliency of that issue, no question, is helpful for Biden. The president, I think, in that exchange was able to sort of muddy the waters and fight it to a draw. But anyone watching was reminded of this, you know, unquestionably dark chapter of the, the Trump era. James, they also talked about catch and release and uh, the policy of allowing people to return and come to a court date. And President Trump said that people who would do that were low IQ and they were stupid. Um, where do you think that puts him with, with voters? I mean, was that something that people could catch in that exchange, that he was saying that people who abide by the law and do what they're told are stupid? It, it really was uh, wild. And I think that there will, that will be one of the things that breaks through uh, tomorrow is, is kind of certain clips go viral uh, and it does fit with sort of his pattern of criticizing people that way. You know, there's questions about Melania Trump's immigration status and the visa that she had and w various things. You know, the, the first lady about how she came here, you know, her parents were able to become U.S. citizens using uh, uh, a, a form of immigration that Trump routinely attacks. Uh, so there is kind of a, a do as I say, not as I do element to that uh, and that line. Uh, interestingly, though, the president wasn't really talking about the border wall. Uh, that wasn't a big a big part of it. Uh, I, I as, he, as he was talking about immigration and catch and release, I thought about uh, how after Boris Johnson, the UK prime minister, recovered from COVID, uh, he's also a conservative, but he went out there and talked about how uh, some of the first responders and the nurses who had taken care of him were immigrants and how uh, much he appreciated them and how much they were contributing. Uh, and, and Trump has sort of not been chastened at all by his COVID experience, but he didn't kind of show any heart when Biden noted that, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of the dreamers that Trump wants to remove from the United States are frontline medical workers. Mm. Um, Dave Weigel, our colleague who covers the White House, Tolu Olurunipa, pointed out that President Trump had been agitating to have foreign policy as part of this debate. He didn't want to talk about COVID, didn't want to talk about you know race relations and domestic issues. He wanted it to be about foreign policy. And yet he used that time uh, in, in, in large part to attack Joe Biden, Dave. Uh, he did, and foreign policy is tricky unless there's a gigantic crisis unfolding as the debate happens. It's very rare that that is the issue that's on voters' minds the most. I mean, just since, since the really since 2004 when uh, George W. Bush was named the election all about the war on terror. So I, uh, in terms of Trump making those arguments, uh, it was another case of him pivot, no, I wouldn't say pivoting, but talking more about issues that complicate <laughs> the, the Republican coalition that maybe add some people that didn't like other Republican nominees. And certainly it wasn't the, the traditional you know, more hawkish Republican position. He was emphasizing, and but he again does this in a way where he's the victim. Where he was, he was criticizing people for saying that his approach to North Korea was going to be dangerous when we haven't actually gone to war yet. Uh, so he didn't make, do a lot with actually defending his foreign policy. And I was struck. We've now debates are over. This is it. Um, not for the show. Don't turn it off. But this is it for the debates. And he's never mentioned the these these uh, agreements negotiated between Israel. Uh, Bahrain and the UAE, 
uh, were they a huge deal that voters care about? No, they were part of a Trump campaign ad. They were part of an effort by Jared Kushner to put points on the board, wins on the board, reintroduce Trump in the final days as an effective world figure. And he never mentioned that. That never really came up. And again, his, his habit of being drawn into a direct attack on the person he's arguing with at that moment, in some ways it's effective. The, the side effect is that it, he ends up never, not really defending in a coherent, memorable way that part of his presidency. Yeah, and Dave, what Jalou was pointing out was that half of the national security section had Trump explaining why he hadn't released his taxes yet. That's what the yeah, conversation ended up coming back to, Dave. Uh, right, and I don't think the, <laughs> I mentioned some chatter I saw online about the, 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 the oil and gas section. Uh, the subtext of that I saw was that just the, the Biden, Hunter Biden section, the, the, there's a risk to saying, hey, in advance, six, six hours in advance, several days in advance, we're going to bring this issue up. That gives not just Joe Biden, but that gives a moderator a chance to think how to ask this in a way that gets people off their talking points. She did so, and he is so defensive and so, uh, frankly, hard to believe on the tax issue. I mean, I was surprised. <laughs> not much surprises me. I was surprised in October 2020 that he's still using his tax answer from the summer of 2015, which is that eventually he'll release them. Uh, but yes, he instead of just pivoting back to a bigger issue, it's not with, with outside of Trump's powers to do what Joe Biden does and say this, in, in so many words, this round is getting ridiculous. Let me talk to you directly about something that, that you care about. He, does, he didn't do it. He defended the taxes. I don't, I don't think many voters were saying I'm, I'm waiting with bated breath to hear him talk more about foreign policy, but he certainly didn't get what he wanted out of that section. No, and it's an opportunity, of course, to seem presidential and like you're the commander in chief um, of, of, of the free world, as they say. Well, let's go to Rhonda Colvin. Um, this debate obviously went so much more smoothly than the last one, Rhonda. Uh, so Kristen Welker got a lot of topics in there. She kept them to time. And even though there was that, you know, muting of the microphones for that two minute portion, let's remember Remember that the microphones were not muted the rest of the time, and so it was up to Kristen Welker to keep things running. Uh, what's your reflection on how this went overall? Uh, you know, she had a lot of enthusiasm from the beginning and really kept things, as you just said, moving and moving quickly. And there was a tweet that one of our producers uh, just uh, pointed out to us that Chris Walls is saying that he's jealous that they had such a, a smooth debate in terms of it going as uh, fast paced and including so much uh, substance or at least more substance than that first one. So I, I think she probably accompl accomplished her job as a moderator. She also did get the benefit of being the last one. So she was able to watch uh, the Chris Wallace's uh, moderation and prepare that way and also the VP debate as well. And so she, she knew what was what the stakes were and uh, I think uh, for her at least this was probably a pretty good moment. All right, thanks so much, Rhonda. Uh, and thanks to all of my colleagues and to you, our viewers tonight, for staying with us to get a sneak peek at what will become the stories that'll be on tomorrow's front page of the Washington Post. I hope you take a minute to subscribe uh, by clicking that subscribe button on our homepage or on YouTube if that's where you're watching, so we can alert you to all the key races and breaking news in this important home stretch of the 2020 election. I'm Libby Casey, and I hope to see you right here on November 3rd so you can spend election night with the Washington Post newsroom. Have a good night.